Good morning, I'm Dr. Isha Makar. I welcome you all to the Northern Chill and the very first Skillshare CME organized by the Department of Pathology, KGMU Lucknow. This academic piece is an initiative that has been taken and excised under the kind guidance of our respected head, Professor U.S. Singh, who is the, our constant inspiration to strive towards excellence. These short skill CME will be carried out in continuum now every four months onward and we are happy to conduct the first concurrently with the Departmental Foundation Day celebration. This CME has provided us with a chance to listen to our distinguished speakers, Professor Sumit Gujral and Dr. Sumita Gokhale. Sir, ma'am, we are extremely honored to have you both with us here. I also want the residents to note that we have a student interaction session post the lectures and I request them to make it fruitful. So without any further delay, I would like to call upon our first gentleman speaker, Sumit Gujral, sir, someone who needs no introduction. There is no pathology resident in India or in fact outside the country who isn't familiar with the OTPPGP, that is the online teaching program for postgraduates in pathology group. Sir, who is a professor at the Department of Pathology, Tata Memorial Center, Mumbai, is the co-founder of this education platform, which is benefiting the pathology residents all over. Thank you so much, sir, for this extremely helpful initiative. Sir has special interest in oncopathology and hematopathology, and today he will be taking a lecture titled, Can it be a lymphoma, Hodgkin lymphoma mimic? I request, sir, now to please take over the stage. Thank you. Thank you very much for kind words. Thank you, sir, and uh, Rashmi for inviting me. It's an honor to be here. I have pen, pen or this pointer, hai, pointer? It's okay, it's otherwise I, I don't need. So this is my hospital where I work. Also, this Bombay looks like this only. Hospitals look like a mall because hospitals are on the road. They don't like, you know, KGMC has a gate and when you enter and you park your car. That hospital, if you come, you have to park your car outside the hospital on the road. So there's no parking place there. So everything in Bombay is on the road, whether it's a school or temple or a hospital. There's no entrance to any anything there. So you enter the classroom straight from the road. <laughs> so I will be talking about uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma mimics, and I'll try to keep it in 25 minutes. I have 30 minutes, but I'll try to keep it short. So uh, lymphoma diagnosis, and I think I'll manage now. I think I'll sit here. Stand here and do it. So, lymphoma is a multidisciplinary diagnosis, like any diagnosis. Whether you make infections or you make cancer diagnosis, any disease you diagnose, it's a multidisciplinary. It cannot be based only on morphology or, or one test. <clears throat> so, you put 10, 7, 8, 10 things together and then you make a diagnosis. Because sometimes I make a wrong diagnosis. My pediatricians call it, soon as how can you call it? a referral T cell lymphoma in a child. So, uh, clinician gives me back. So, I cannot diagnose few lymphomas in children because they're very, very rare. So, everything put together, we give a diagnosis. And if, if this slide shows you which are the common lymphomas which a postgraduate should know in adults, these are two common lymphomas, Hodgkin lymphoma and DLBCL. These constitute together maybe more than 60% of lymphomas, 70% lymphomas. Surely 60%. And in children, Hodgkin's, P lymphoblastic lymphoma and mediastinum, Burkitt's ALCL, yeah. 
And if you add the leukemias, then precursor B cell A in children. So these all together would be, in children, 99% of leukemias, lymphomas are here. If you include B cell A. And in adults, after this, you have T cell, peripheral T cell lymphomas, AITLs, and follicular lymphomas. So now Hodgkin's lymphoma, how do you diagnose Hodgkin's lymphoma? Now, um, Hodgkin's always called as Hodgkin's disease. For many years, it was Hodgkin's disease. Why? Because the tumor cells were scanty. So something like inflammatory lesion. So they always call as disease. Tumor cells are always less than 1%, generally less than 1%. 99% cells are the mi microenvironment. And the microenvironment has lymphocytes, eosinophils, histiocytes, plasma cells. So tumor cells are very scanty. So we do not know. Both are important actually because when you give chemotherapy or radiotherapy, everything disappears. So the microenvironment also goes away, even the tumor cells go. So they are feeding each other. The microenvironment is doing something so that the tumor becomes big. So the tumor cells are very few. Now, if you look at the types of Hodgkin, the two types, classical Hodgkin's and NLPHL, okay? They are very similar diseases, but they're very different because NLPHL is a B-cell lymphoma. Classical Hodgkin's lymphoma is a B-cell lymphoma, but, you know, 20, 19, these common B-cell markers are negative. So it's a kind of mutated B-cell. It's a bad B-cell where the B-cell markers are generally lost. So you need to do some transcriptional factors, right? B-cell transcription factors, which are like POC, PAX5. Oct 2 Bob, mainly Pax5. So, so, but they're put in the same category of Hodgkin's. Why? Because again, the tumor cells are very scanty in NLPHL as well as in classical Hodgkin's lymphoma. <coughs> so there is a lot of debate that NLPHL should be out of Hodgkin's and should be called as low-grade B-cell lymphoma. Now, I give you examples. I have five, six examples. Quickly, we'll go, depending upon the time. So this is a young young male who come who come, came to Tata Hospital, left cervical node, three months duration. And biopsy is done, you know, polymorphous picture, you see the large cells, there are some eosinophils, lymphocytes, plasma cells. Is it light? Come do you want to do it? Then you can see it. possible. Rashmi, you sit, somebody else will do it. Rashmi, you sit. So there are, you can see that there's a mix of different types of cells, small lymphocytes, large tumor cells, eosinophils, plasma cells. So differentials are Hodgkin's carcinoma, ALCL, you know, metastatic carcinoma, these are the differentials come to mind. But I do hematopath, so I think of lymphoma first and look like lymphoma to me. So I, what I do, I do common stains, three common stains, actually two common stains, three and 20. LCA is not required that much in lymphomas, rarely you need it, but three and 20 are mandatory for every one of us to know. Three is a CD3 is a T cell marker, 20 is a B cell marker. 20 is not the best marker for B cells, but we use 20 because it is it is for traduximab. Because clinicians give anti CD20 drug for B cell lymphomas, DLBCLs. So that's why 20 is more popular than 19. However, 19 is the best marker, followed by 17 and alpha, and PAX5. 20 is not a good marker for B cell because many B cell lymphomas are CD20 negative, like Hodgkin's. Plasma blastic lymphomas, ALK positive DLBCLs, the B lymphoblastic lymphomas, they are B20 negative. Mostly they are 20 negative. So we did all these markers and they are all negative. LCA3, 20 negative. So can it be lymphoma or no? It can still be lymphoma. As I said, Hodgkin's is 20 negative and Hodgkin's is a B cell lymphoma. So we did more stains, CD15, 30 positive, PAX5 positive. So we called it a classical Hodgkin's lymphoma with a heavy tumor load. But there's nothing called as heavy tumor load. We just reported it. Classical Hodgkin's lymphoma. So now, definition of the Hodgkin's lymphoma in the new WHO is you know, defined in a slightly better way. I can read it. I'll read it for you. <coughs> classical Hodgkin's lymphoma is a neoplasm derived from germinal center B cells characterized by scanty tumor cells. Scanty tumor cells. Right. Embedded in a reactive microenvironment rich in immune cells. Now, the large neoplastic cells show a defective as you told you, defective B cell program. So this is a definition of Hodgkin's lymphoma. Now, um, now as a, this is a, as a postgraduate, as a consultant reporting lymphomas day in day out, I have, I have to when Hodgkin's is the most easily diagnosed lymphoma because we know you taught RSLs, Hodgkin's, but Hodgkin's is the most commonly misdiagnosed, overdiagnosed lymphoma because there are so many mimics of Hodgkin's and mostly are, mostly are benign. So we have 
we have been making a lot of mistakes in Hodgkin's and the most of the cases which come for second opinion or third opinion, they come to us or from us, they go somewhere else. But second opinion or third opinion are Hodgkin's. So when you diagnose Hodgkin's, you have to be very careful because it's the easiest to diagnose. But obviously anything which is easy to diagnose will be overdiagnosed also. So you have to look at all. Cap, and as far as pathologist is concerned, you have to look at capsule, eosinophils, classical RSLs, environment, background. If you don't see eosinophils, don't see thick capsule, don't see classical RSLs, you have to really think 100 times before you call it Hodgkin's. Or you said NLPH or some variant. So then take a second opinion because CD30 can be positive in anything. Pax5, weak, moderate can come even in viral infections. So only on ISCs you might go wrong. So you have... Sometimes there are lots of like ISCs mm -hmm. and which show uh, I mean strong positivity for CD20 also. So in that case, uh, should we report as a Hodgkin lymphoma or it could be like B cell lymphoma with CD30, aberrant 30 positivity? It's case to case, which I will be, not be able to answer like this. 10, 15 percent, 20 percent cases of Hodgkin's can express 20. 20 percent cases or 25 percent cases of Hodgkin's, classical Hodgkin's. There are two, three cases like I have seen and But then I would, uh, I would uh, look at the morphology. I, li I like to see the other markers and I like to rule out NLPHL or T cell, B cell lymphoma or it's just not an EBV proliferations. Because EBV proliferations can show you 20 strong, 30 positive. They could be immunoblasts. So that, these are the common, I'll come to those. I'll show you examples and I think we'll walk through. Uh, so you need markers. Uh, these are the bare markers. Six, seven markers, these are the must. Three, 20, 15, 30, EBV, Pax5. These are the five, six markers. We do traditionally for all suspected Hodgkin's. Then we can do more if you don't have an answer. So there is importance, right, for postgraduates. If you're practicing <coughs> lymphomas, and, uh, Lymph nodes and Hodgkin's, if you don't diagnose Hodgkin's in the extra nodal sites, okay? If you have a GIT or a somewhere else, tongue, tonsils, avoid diagnosing Hodgkin's. Just be careful. It could be some immune deficiency related proliferation here. Hodgkin's are classically in the lymph nodes. Non-Hodgkin's can be anywhere, but Hodgkin's are classically in the lymph nodes and mediastinum. RS cells are LCA and 20 negative mostly, mostly. RS cells can be seen in many conditions. RS-like cells. RS-like cells can be seen in many, many conditions. They can be benign, they can be other malignant. Now, CD30 is not a magic marker. It can be seen in, again, many benign immunoblasts, many other tumor cells, plasma cells. So, CD30 can be positive in many benign immunoblastic proliferation. So, CD30 positivity doesn't make it Hodgkin's. So, if you think those RS cells, which are you're not sure, they're RS cells, and you so, and you see 30 positivity, it doesn't become Hodgkin's. So your diagnosis is basically based on morphology and clinical. And ILC should substantiate. If they're not matching, then you have to think again. Don't call it Hodgkin's. Then, as I told you, um, diagnosis of Pax5 negative Hodgkin's should be made with caution. These are rare now. Pax5 has to be positive. If some rarely Pax5 can be negative, you have to be careful. Do additional states. Now, classically, in classical Hodgkin's lymphoma, the background is all... T cells. So that's why classical Hodgkin's and perfect T cell lymphomas are close different. Classical Hodgkin's lymphoma and perfect T cell lymphoma because the 90% of the cells in the background are T cells. Except in the lymphocyte rich classical Hodgkin's lymphoma where you can get more B cells. And NLPHL obviously can show you more B cells. Yeah. Many NHLs will show you RS like cells. It doesn't become composite lymphoma. We'll show you the examples. So now this is CD30 now. This is a Lymphoma I've shown you. Now, those two cases are both benign. They are not lymphomas. That was a case of some, some uh, EB, both are EBV-related proliferations. Or one could be normal lymph node. So those two cases, 30 positive, are the normal lymph nodes. Now, this is a case of CLL. You can get large para-immunoblast, para immunoblast-like cells. They can, they'll be 30 positive. You don't call it composite lymphoma. Now, what are the mimics of lymph Hodgkin's? This is important slides. So you look at this. These are the all viral infections. EBV, EBV, EBV. EBV is the commonest infection we have in India. In West also, but in India, very, very common. So EBV proliferations are extremely common. So you'd never do a lymph node biopsy of a child who has got lymph nodes less than one month or two months duration. So less than one month duration, less than two centimeter size, do not do a biopsy. Wait. They will resolve because they are mostly 
for viral infections. Generally, it happens is they're all VIPs, the doctor's kids, they get, you know, if you see a node, you go to the clinic and you get the biopsy done, and then you have problems. They can be misdiagnosed as Hodgkin's, because I told you there are RS like cells 30 positive, and immune deficiencies now. Now, dysregulation of immune, <coughs> means that senescence, old age, HIV, many conditions can show you RS like cells. They may be Hodgkin's, they may be like Hodgkin's. We'll show you a case if we have time. Then there are B cell lymphomas, other B cell lymphomas which can mimic classical Hodgkin's. One is NLPHL, which is a type of Hodgkin's. Then this is a high grade lymphoma, T cell associated B cell lymphoma, and gray zone. These are very bad lymphomas. Gray zone generally occurs in media sanum, which has features of Hodgkin's as well as DLBCL. T cell B cell lymphoma is again a lymphoma which has very scanty tumor cells. Background is all T, tumor cells are scanty. Now these cells are again difficult to diagnose. Now your diagnosis is based on morphology. If the large cells are geoplastic, it is T cell which B cell lymphoma. But if the large cells are immunoblast and the background small cells are neoplastic, then maybe it's a PTCL with immunoblast. So morphology is extremely important. You have to decide which are your cells of interest. So if you take, pick up the wrong cells of interest, then your ILC will you know, follow you. So you'll give a wrong biopsy. So ILC, not, not to be blamed here, our morphology has to be obviously all things together. as a truly clinical picture, morphology, all. Then similarly, we have T cell lymphomas, which can mimic, which can mimic Hodgkin's. Peripheral T cell lymphoma, AITLs. Oh, we have so many <coughs> diagnoses of. I'll show you a case of AITL, classical Hodgkin's. It's AITL. AITL has RS-like cells, angioimmunoblastic T cell lymphoma. It's a type of T cell lymphoma, mature T cell lymphoma. It's a follicular T helper cell lymphoma. ALCL, we know that. ALK negative ALCL can be a tricky situation. ALK negative. So if you have problems in H&E, so how many problems do you have in FNACs? So in FNAC, long story short, you can just suggest, I suspect Hodgkin's lymphoma, I want a biopsy to be done. That's a report we do now. Nobody diagnoses Hodgkin's on FNACs. We just write, I suspect Hodgkin's, please do a whole node biopsy. Okay, I think I'll skip this. Um, background cells that spoken, I think I'll skip this. Now, this is the slide for postgraduate. So how do you diagnose Hodgkin's? The last answer is number four. You need morphology and you need a panel of markers. And then you obviously need clinical details before you call it Hodgkin's. Now I'm going to the second type of Hodgkin's, which is NLPHL. We, we discussed about classical Hodgkin's and the differential. Now I go to the second type of Hodgkin's, which is NLPHL, which is a low-grade B-cell lymphoma, also called by some groups. And it's fine. So there are big nodules you can see. You know these big, big nodules? They look like large nodules, maybe one nodule, maybe three, four, five, six, many nodules. They might show you some normal lymph node. These nodules are basically PTGCs. They are progressive transformation of germinal centers. What is it? Is it a secondary follicle we all know? There's germinal center, there's mantle, marginal. What happens here? The cells go inside the germinal center, they diffuse. And all mantle, marginal zone, they become together on big nodule. So you don't see the mantle, marginal, and germinal center. So this becomes like PTGCs. And in this PTGCs, if you find the tumor cells, then it becomes NLPHL. So PTGC plus tumor cells is NLPHL. PTGC is otherwise a very common condition. If you have a mastectomy specimen or a head neck uh, dissection, you'll find many nodes showing you PTGCs changes. <coughs> it doesn't become malignant. So NLPHL is a B-cell lymphoma with a retained CD20. Now this Hodgkin has CD20 positive. Classical was CD20 negative. NLPHL is CD20 positive. I'm going a little fast for the first year, second year pathology student, so you have to pardon me. Because mimics is not a talk for postgraduates, I think. We, I, I, we, this was a matter of problems. There are many patterns of NLPHL, many, many patterns. Defined by Yashoda, not a beautiful article. I can show you a picture at you next. I won't go into the details of that. Here. It's a differences of NLPHL again. Benign. Progressive transformation. Don't, if you have doubt, if you're not sure of tumor cells, they just show you not you, just call it PTGC, leave it there. Because NLPHL is itself a very low grade lymphoma, mostly stage 1A. One means the stages of, you know, you staging of lymphomas. So NLPHLs are mostly stage 1, few of them are stage 2. They're rarely four. If they are four, we think of a T cell B cell lymphoma or something. Because they are treated like T cell B cell lymphoma then. <coughs> so NLPHL, T cell B cell lymphoma is a kind of a 
a spectrum with the DLBC, going to the DLBCs. And then T cell induced lymphoma and lymphocytic classical, these can be differentials. And I think I'll skip this. Now, this is interesting PAX5. I told you PAX5 is a magic marker in Hodgkin's. So, you do not diagnose Hodgkin's without PAX5 and 30. You need bigger panels, but these two markers are essential. And 20 also. 20 should be negative, preferably negative, or weak positive. 30 should be strong. And when you look at 30, they should not be cute looking immunoblasts. They should be like that. You see this? They're not really immunoblasts. These are large cells. You can see that they are bhyankar looking cells. These are tumor cells. So CD30 has to be positive in the bad looking cells, not in the cute looking cells. Cute looking cells, the round, slightly largest, will be immunoblasts. So, but that is not immunoblast. So that immuno, that PAX5 is very strong in the tumor cells. Why do I say strong? Because even the small lymphocytes are the internal control for PAX5 is normal B cells. So if you if you look at these are the normal B cells, these two. They are very strongly for PAX5. If you look at the tumor cells, these are the tumor cells. They are, <coughs> they are weakly positive. So this is a classical example of classical Hodgkin lymphoma. And then PHL PAX5 is strong. Like 20 is positive. So in NLPHL, 20 is positive, PAX5 is strong. In classical Hodgkin's, 20 is negative and PAX5 is weak. And how do I compare weak? In every IHC, you have to, you don't have to just say positive, negative. I repeat, in IHCs, you don't have to say positive, negative. First, you have to see cells of interest. Then you have to see the other cells. Then you have to see, are they weak, positive, strong, positive, positive, or they kind of show you a pattern. Pattern means there are some cells are weak, some tumor cells are weak, some tumor cells are strong. Heterogeneous pattern. And then how many cells are positive? Are there all sheets of them or there are few of them are positive? So IHC is just not positive and negative, much more than that. So when you're doing IHC interpretation, you have to be careful how do you report that. So that is classical, uh, this is classical Hodgkin's, that is NLPHL PAX5. Now we have something called as rosetting of T cells for the tumor cells, like this is a classical RSL. Here, it, it is rosetted mostly by CD4 positive T cells. Classical Hodgkin's background is mostly CD4 positive T cells. But then there are RS like cells which can be seen in AITLs, NLPHLs, and lymphocyte rich classical Hodgkin's lymphomas. There, these T cells are follicular T cells. <coughs> follicular T cells. I mean, these are cells which express. They come from the German center. So these are the CD4. Generally, CD4 positive T cells are in the paracortical zone, CD4 and CD8. There are very few T follicular helper cells which are sitting in the B area of the B cells. Wo B cell ka ilake mein kuch T cells bethe hai. Wo B cell ka ilaka kya hai? Germinal center. Where you have to have centrocytes, centroblasts, histocytes, dendritic cells. There are few T follicular helper cells there. Very few. And those T follicular helper cells from the germinal center give rise to a lymphoma called as AITL. The new name is nodular T follicular helper cell lymphomas. So those lymphomas, NLPHL, they have a rosetting of tumor cells by T follicular helper cells. T follicular helper cells. These are the CD4 positive and those T cells will express 4. They will also express PD1, ICOS, there are many BCL6, <coughs> CD10, you know, there are 5, 6 markers for here they won't express. They will express only 4. They won't express PD1, no ICOS. But you can, these can help you in some tricky situation. You tell me stop me at 925, please. 925. Uh, case 2 is 32 male, left axillary node. I think I'll skip these two NLPHL cases. I'll go to simpler. These are more complicated. This is a nice picture. This is a Ladakh, you know. You see this. Uh, the grass is green and some reddish grass on a beautiful sunny day. Uh, I'll skip this. I'll go to the. This, yeah, this is a Yashoda's uh, coming new WHO. Uh, you know, six patterns of NLPHL based on a cartoon, a chindi, and IHCs. So there are six patterns of NLPHL defined. So now, what happened in Tata Hospital where I work? I'm sure in KGMC also, uh, maybe in the United States too. Uh, the surgeons they send you needle core biopsies. The needle core biopsies have indications in lymphomas. One, patient is in ICU. You can't take him to the OT. Second, inaccessible sites like retroperitoneal, media standard. But now, if even as a big node, surgeons will do needle core. 
they get equal money and they have quick. So they save their uh, time, but they give, create problems for us pathologists because renal core biopsy are tricky. They're small material, but nevertheless, they are much better than FNACs. So we have to now develop an expertise to give opinion on needle core biopsies. So here, they have issues. Like we colleagues have issues in the department. So you have to sort them out over coffee. See, everybody is happy. All the cups are finished. This is Subramaniam, this is Nikhil, uh, Gaurav, and Prashant. I go to the next case. Uh, th 35 male generalized nodes, supraclavicular. Now, supraclavicular is a site where you get only metastatic carcinomas, you know? And which lymphomas you can get in supraclavicular nodes? Gray zone lymphoma. Because supraclavicular is a part of supraclavicular is a part of medicine. So you get, um, if you have a lymphoma there, you think of gray zone, which is coming from mediastinum, which is a kind of overlap between Hodgkin's and DLGCR. So here I'll show you these pictures. You see, this is a, there's some fibrosis, there are nodules, there's a necrosis, there's a polymorphous picture of lymphoid cells, um, pleomorphic picture as well as polymorphic picture, tumor cells, I'll just skip through. You can see some tumor cells here and the histocytes in the background. We did, these are the like tumor cells, you can see here. Uh, we did IHCs, the differences were Hodgkin's and ALCL. We did IHCs, this panel, I told you these are six markers we do for Hodgkin's. 320, 1530, EBB, PAX5, and they're all positive for 20. You see that 20? Membrane. This is called a membrane positivity. It means membrane, they're all around the membrane. They're not in the cytoplasm. They're not in the nucleus. They're in the membrane. Cytoplasm for myeloproxidase. Nuclear TDT, sac one ERPR. So these are all, most of the CD markers when we do, they're mostly membrane. Now this is 15. 15 is positive, 30, 30 is positive. So... It has the features of classical Hodgkin's lymphoma, but is expressing 20. Now, 15 is positive in classical Hodgkin's. 15, 30 is classically positive in classical Hodgkin's. But 20 is only negative or weak. It's pretty strong here. So then we did more markers. So this was a CD20 positive Hodgkin's lymphoma, and it was strong. Now, since it was media channel and supraclavicular area, we call it gray zone lymphoma. So gray zone lymphomas are like between Hodgkin's and DLBCL. So it has features, sheets of tumor cells, all expressing 20, 30, and 15 also. And I think EBV, PAX5 was strong, moderate to strong. Yeah, it's all, we did multiple markers, they're positive. <coughs> GATA3, Bobbin, all of, all of them are positive. They're not supposed to be positive in classical Hodgkin's. Yeah. I think I'll skip this. This is, this is case of media cell, uh, gray zone. And obviously, uh, nodes were there, but patient had a super, this is a supraclavicular node, perhaps. Quickly, two cases now. This, these are the interesting cases. The, both cases referred to us from KEM hospital. Both youngsters, both are immunocompromised. One has a lung biopsy, one has a GI biopsy. Lung and GI. And both are called as Hodgkin's. And both were mucocutaneous ulcers. Both were mucocutaneous. Because mucocutaneous, as I told you, don't diagnose Hodgkin's on the mucosal sites. Don't diagnose Hodgkin's on extra nodal sites. So if you have a Hodgkin's in stomach, you think about something else. It's either DLBCL, EBV positive, or it could be mucocutaneous ulcer. So here, these are the biopsies. You know, you can see that some gland and the ulcer there. And if you do IHCs in these tumor cells, which are scattered, they're all positive for 20, 30 EBV positive. Pax5 was strong though, but it can be even weak. Even if Pax5 is weak, don't diagnose Hodgkin's on the external side. You have to be careful. Second case was case of rheumatoid arthritis on mesotaxate. This is a lung biopsy, ulcerating lesion in the bronchus. Again, some tumors, large cells. You know, if you think these are RSLs, there may be some useful. If you think these are RSL, then you do 20 and 30. 30 may be positive. It doesn't become lymphoma. Again, PAX5 positive. EBV was strongly positive. Now, this is LMP1. I'm not talking about Iberish. The best thing is to do is Iberish. In situ hybridization for Epstein Barovirus not the IHC. You should do in-situ hybridization. We don't do it regularly because it's expensive for the lab. So we do IHC and you use EBV LMT1, which is not the best marker because it'll pick up very small spectrum of the EBVs. So this was, so both cases we told the, the clinicians to stop the whatever drug, visotraxate and the other drugs they were giving and the lesions disappeared. So these were the EBV mucocutaneous ulcers are seen commonly in immunocompromised patients or some drugs or some, you know, you have to find out the history. 
and if you take care of that immuno, Im immune status, the lesions disappear. You don't need, need to give chemotherapy here. These are not Hodgkin's. Next case, generalized note, six months, 63-year-old male. Okay? Now, this case I'll go, you know, you can see paracortical T-zone expansion. And the slides are not very good, actually. But there are RS-like cells. And the background cells look reactive, activated, benign. But we were so focused on RS cells and we did IHCs. It was all positive for whatever you wanted to see. You know, but background is good in 20, you know. And in classical Hodgkin's, you don't see so many follicles. Hodgkin's is B cell depleted, mostly. The classical Hodgkin's lymphoma, mostly it is T cells, okay. So we did all markers. You see CD20 was, some cells were weak, positive, okay. Mostly they were negative. This is a weak positive, the large cell. And then we did PAXY was weak, 30 was positive, EBV was positive. 15, maybe some cells are positive. Some, but mostly they are uh, neut in neutrophils and histiocytes, some eosinophils. So it's classical uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma immunophenotype. We call it classical Hodgkin's. <coughs> but here, some of the background cells, the T cells, which are activated, they are also expressing BCL6 and 10. So T cell panel we did in the background. It didn't show any loss of any marker. So we called it um, um, classical Hodgkin's lymphoma. Bone marrow was stent for staging. Bone marrow for all lymphomas is, being, is done for staging. And we, we do flow for all lymphomas. So Tata Hospital has money. So we, we do flow for all lymphomas. Normal looking, abnormal looking. So we do almost 35, 40 flows per day. Out of which maybe 10 would be lymphoma screenings. So here when we did flow for Hodgkin's lymphoma, we realized there is an abnormal T cell population. You see the CD3 on the Y axis and CD5 on the X axis. Those blue cells on the top are T cells. Why? They express 3 and 5 both. Now this purple cells are 5 positive, they are 3 negative. So this is abnormal. They have lost 3. So which are the T cells which will lose 3 and have 5? These are normal. Because the blue cells are normal, they are expressing 3 as well as 5. And these cells at the zero level, they are negative, they're not T cells. But these cells are abnormal T cells, the purple one. They have lost three. So on the flow, we have seen now many cases, almost 47 cases. And we have picked up these AITS based on this plot. Now it has been published also by one of our, somebody known to us from West. And our lab also has published now. And one of our residents got the best paper award in ESCA. ESCA is the European Society meeting. It was in Ireland. And she got the best post award, our resident, on this plot, picking up AITLs. So AITLs are picked up by only one plot if you're doing flow. There are five positive, surface three, three negative. <coughs> surface three, three negative. But there are background cells, three positive. So there are many cells which are normal T cells, but there are few cells which have lost three. Now you can't believe only on one stain. Then you do ICOS, PD1, BCL6. CD10, other markers, CXCR. So you do multiple markers, and based on that, this was called as like CD279, A185. So then we repeated FNAC from the same site. We did the FNA also, thinking this may be a wrong thing. FNAC also, you know, three positive, five negative. Uh, sorry, five positive, three negative. And CD4 positive. You see that CD4, all these cells are five positive and four positive, all the red cells. And they're all PD1, ICOS positive, 279 alpha, 279 positive. 185 positive. So, this was a case of EITL which has a lot of RS-like cells. So, you have to be careful. I'm not trying to scare you, but I'm sharing with you where we have burnt our fingers and continue to burn our fingers. We make a lot of mistakes in Hodgkin's. Yeah, I think I'll skip this flow, Hodgkin's. I'll go to my... Ah, this is interesting. I have two short cases. I have time, five minutes? I just, five minutes. So this is, I'll just take two, two minutes. This is a case of infectious mononucleosis. You know, again, young kid, as I told you, you don't need to do baths. But it's not young. This is for 46. This has immunocompromised status. So diffuse pattern, lymphocytes, histocytes, <coughs> thanks to this Anita's case. And there are some RSI cells, lymphocytes, histocytes, and nobody's there, like this cell, this cell, that cell. Now if I do 30, they'll be positive. So I don't call it Hodgkin's. Because I'm not convinced there are no eosinophils. Capsule is not there. But Hodgkin's is, is the differential, maybe. But it's not like a classical, classical lymphoma. 
classical classical Hutchins lymphoma. So yeah, RSXL, 20 is strongly positive, 30 is positive. You know, Eber is positive, Octo, Bobin, everything. Pexa is also moderate positive. All markers are positive, so unlikely. So we called it EBV associated lymphoproliferation. And quite a few of these cases, from here they go to Dr. Len Jaffe also. Few of our very complicated cases. And mostly diagnosis match, but few of them they develop lymphomas over a few months or years. So you have to give a caution, these have to be followed up. So EBV proliferation from Hodgkin's lymphoma is a very tricky situation. If you are doubting, better to call it EBV proliferations and follow up. It, it can be tricky. Okay, I think I will uh, go to the last case. This is a young boy, fever, weight loss, right-sided striker swelling. Lymph node biopsy was done, and this is a biopsy. Diffuse pattern shows the lymphocytes, some histocytes, and some eosinophils. You can see many eosinophils here, colorful cells, and those lacunar RS-like cells. Many RS-like cells here. You know, mononuclear, they are here with prominent nuclei. So diagnosis, eosinophils. I told you eosinophils you have to see. Don't call it Hodgkin's without eosinophils. Without going, I'll think of yours, Hodgkin's now. But any other differences you have? Young boy, neck node. So we did ILCs, LC negative, 20 negative, 30 positive, EBV positive. It was not Hodgkin's, no. It is a carcinoma, it's a metastatic nasopharyngeal carcinoma. This is, those are car epithelial cells. So, you know, EBV positive, 30 positive doesn't make it lymphomas. Pax5 didn't do that time. I didn't show you. So you should have asked me, sir, Pax5. So Pax5 was negative, cytokeratin was positive, and uh, it was a case of nasopharyngeal carcinoma. So these are so many mimics of Hodgkin's lymphomas. I think I'll stop here. Uh, these are lymphoma group of Bombay. <coughs> Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir, for an illuminating insight into the world of Hodgkin lymphoma. We thoroughly enjoyed listening to you and gained a lot. Now we have a session, slight discussion by Sumita Gokhale, ma'am, which will be followed by her lecture on interpreting breast biopsies and excision. Ma'am has been kind enough to share the slides with us, with us earlier, which have already been shown to our residents. Ma'am is an alumni of AGMU, and she's currently working as an associate pathologist in Beth Israel Lehi Health Winchester Hospital, Strata DX, Lexington, MA. She has won several awards for her work and was also awarded the 40 Under 40 Award in the state of Rhode Island for two consecutive years. Ma'am has also served as an inspector for the College of American Pathologists last year, 2022. She has special interest in breast pathology and cytopathology. I request ma'am to please come up on stage for the session. Thank you. So thank you for the very kind in, uh, introduction. I'm very happy to be back uh, after about um, just about over a year. I was here in November of uh, 2021. So it's nice to see some familiar faces here. And uh, thank you, Professor Singh, for the invitation and Preeti for um, kind of coordinating everything. Um, and it's very nice to meet uh, Dr. Gujral from TMH uh, in the wonderful lecture. So thank you. And um, so in speaking with Preeti when we were preparing for this lecture, I learned that um, perhaps breast would be a good topic to discuss. And she also mentioned that although you all get to see a lot of cancers, because most of the patients by the time they come um, to show themselves to the doctors, they have advanced uh, you know, cancers. So those are something you are seeing a lot of the times but you don't get to see as many uh, benign uh, lesions uh, or borderline lesions. So I thought uh, that I'll probably concentrate my talk uh, on those lesions. Um, so I have brought some slides, some h &E sections, and there are probably about 15 cases in that box. 
And uh, so thanks to Shalini who picked up the slides from me last night. And uh, one of the residents, I don't know her name, but she, uh, maybe you can identify yourself. So thank you. What is your name? Yes. So thank you so much for picking up the slides and bringing them early in the morning today. And thanks for everyone um, to look at the slides. So I think it will be more interactive. So pitch in, uh, you know, when I show the slides. Uh, and as I said, it's not all of the cases that I'm showing here because there were quite a few. Um, so I've selected about six or seven cases which we will discuss here. And um, if you have written down something or if you just have it in your mind, just you know, feel free to speak up and describe the case. Um, so the first um, case, and as Dr. Gujral mentioned, you know that when you are looking at a case, uh, okay, it's not moving forward. Just look in the center, please. Look in the center. Nope. Maybe I need some. So, um, thank you. So, as Dr. Gujran mentioned, that when you're looking at a case, don't look at it in just isolation. You know, you want to have a clinical history, look at the imaging, get all the relevant data, and then you look at the case. So, it's, so a diagnosis is never made just, you know, in isolation. Uh, you want to put everything together, and everything should make sense. Um, so this first case is uh, of a 52-year-old uh, female, and this biopsy was done for a mass. Um, so most of the biopsies in breast you know, will be done either for a mass uh, or architectural distortion or calcification. So those are some of the three you know, most common reasons why someone would get a biopsy of the lesion. Um, so by ultrasound, uh, this seemed to be a solid mass with lobulated borders, and it's relatively large, so it was 3.7 cm, and perhaps the patient could even uh, palpate it herself. So this is a low-par view of the biopsy. So always start with, you know, the low-par, get a feel of what it looks like, uh, because when you go on high par, everything begins to look very ugly, all the nuclei look very ugly, so just get an impression on the low-par. Um, so would uh, anyone like to uh, describe? No? Okay, so it kind of, so on the low bar, uh, you know, it kind of looked busy, just very blue. Um, so the stroma, if I want to go back, so here. So the stroma kind of looks busy. And, and uh, then you have some of the ducts in the middle. Now you go a little bit higher bar, and on this, um, just this arrow show up here. So this is the higher bar, and any takers for this? Uh, just to describe what you're seeing. So the stroma, you can start with the stroma, it looks busy, right? And so these are mostly spindle cells. Do they look very ugly, not too ugly, a little bit bad looking? What can you say about the cellularity? It's higher than the usual normal breast parenchyma. And the ducts don't look all that bad. There's not a whole lot of proliferation within the ducts. So just based on this, you know, you can say that it's a fibroepithelial lesion with cellular stroma. So the main differential would be a fibroadenoma, phylloides tumor. Um, those would be kind of the big ones. And uh, if it had just had, you know, not a two-cellular stroma, you would have probably just called it a fibroadenoma, straightforward, right? You wouldn't even worry about anything. But this one, because it has some one cellular stroma, so you want to keep your diagnosis open on just this biopsy. You don't want to jump to a diagnosis of a fibroadenoma. Um, so you, this is how we worded it. And uh, so this patient went on to have an excision. And on this, like in the low bar, you can see the nice the epithelial clefts that are very typical for a phylloides tumor. And you can see this uh, by gross also when you are grossing the specimen. You can really see the nice clefts and they tend to kind of uh, fall apart. So the other thing you want to look for, um, so, that's, so that's your impression on the low bar now. So you go to 4X. And so what are you looking at 4X? What, what do you want to look for for a phylloides tumor? So once you have decided that this is a phylloides tumor, now you want to make out, is this a benign, borderline, or malignant phylloides tumor? So th those are the main three you know, categories. Uh, and because this is an excision, so you want to have a definitive diagnosis. So on the 4X, um, can anyone say what we are looking for? 
stromal overgrowth, right? So what that means is that if at 4x we see no ducts and just the stroma, then there is cellular uh, stromal overgrowth, right? So on 4x we are seeing quite a few ducts, so we do not have the stromal overgrowth. And uh, the other thing, so the, the nuclei on the biopsy were similar to what was on the excision, and they did not look all that bad. So there was some increase in the stromal cellularity, but the ATP was not marked. Now you look at the borders, because you want to decide is this malignant, borderline benign. So one of the other things you want to look at is the border. So how does this look to you? Feel free to speak up. It's okay to be, you know, um, just guess, and, and you have looked at the slide, and you have a picture, so just be descriptive, because pathology is all about descriptions. So when you're writing uh, uh, your report, you know, the wording is um, has to be really appropriate so that the clinicians understand what you are saying, and you are on the same page, so you have to practice that also. So uh, feel free to describe. So, hmm? Sort of pushing, now is this like a very well-defined or do you think it's kind of, it's sort of infiltrative, right? Because you have this uh, adipocytes and it's just kind of the cells to seem to be traveling in between. So this is a somewhat of infiltrative border is what you would call it, permeative or infiltrative. So what, so, so these are the main, you know, things that you look at to decide whether it's a benign borderline or malignant tumor. And in this particular case, you found that the stromal cellularity was mildly increased. Uh, there was very little atypia, not a whole lot. So the stro stromal cellularity, how will you say it's increased? So there's some overlapping of the nuclei, right? So that's how you would say. Uh, there was no stromal overgrowth, because we saw that on the forex. And the tumor borders fall in this category of somewhat infiltrative. And we did not find any heterologous components, meaning like a liposarc or a chondrosarc. So um, a few years ago, up until a few years ago, if you found a well-differentiated liposarcoma, it would have been placed under the malignant category, but no longer that, because they found that the like the CTK4 and NDN2, the alterations that you see in the typical well-differentiated liposarcoma are not seen in the breast. Therefore, if you just have liposarcoma, like a well-differentiated liposarcoma, we do not put those phylloides tumor in the malignant category. So that's something to remember. Um, but of course, you know, if you have the other, like chondrosarcs or mimarsarcs, so those would be under the malignant category. So um, based on this, uh, how would you like to characterize our case? Where do you think? Borderline, right? So in, in such cases, uh, always include a synoptic report, go to the CAP website, and they always have an updated report. And it's such a good, and I think you all use that. I think we talked about it the last time also. Um, and it has the, like the updated version of on the, uh, the staging and classification. So utilize that. So in this case, really no use of immunostains. It's all morphology. So pay attention to the h &E sections and um, look at the borders carefully, nuclear etopia. So those are the things you want to look at. So this was a borderline phylloides tumor. So now this next case, so as we said, so one for a mass, and then you can have architectural distortion, so you get a biopsy for that. And um, so this is a 65-year-old uh, woman, and um, she has this architectural distortion, so she gets a biopsy, and uh, followed by an excision. So uh, any takers for this one? What do we see here? So on the low bar, we have these some glands uh, or ducts you can make out, um, and some, this stroma, some fibrostroma. And uh, it's kind of a fibroelastotic stroma, right, with this bluish kind of a thing. Almost looks like a scar with a dense fibrous uh, stroma. And how would you describe these ducts? Do they look ugly? How do the nuclei look? Huh? Nine by, I have nine by 
So are you seeing the myoepithelial cells? Can you make out the myoepithelial cells on this? Did you see them? So as you said, I mean, they, they don't look bad. They're kind of bland appearing, the small ducts. And um, so now, you know, we do want to use the immunostains because myopathical cells kind of, are kind of hard to, you know, see just by HME. And the only objective way of proving whether or not there, there are myopathical cells is by immunostain. So one of the immunostains that we use very often is a micro eye. It's a triple stain. And um, it has a P63, which uh, will stain your myopathical cell nuclei, like, I, like you see here in this normal duct. And the CK56 component also will stain the myopathical cells, mostly like the cytoplasm of it. And uh, the CK818, which is a pink stain, or a magenta stain, will um, stain the epithelial cells. So we find this very useful uh, because uh, you, you, know, you see all the three components in just one. So this one has intact uh, myopathial cells like you see here. Um, we have this brown staining of the myopathial cells and then the epithelial cells are highlighted by the pink. So this was a radial scar or a complex sclerosing lesion. And you often see this and these can be so tricky, so tricky. And I sometimes wonder what we do what would we do without immunostains? And in the past, there were no immunostains and just HME. So sometimes, I mean, these women would be diagnosed with cancer and, um, and they really did not have cancer. And because these are so difficult to differentiate from a low-grade uh, invasive carcinoma. Yes. Amicar, yeah, or, or just P63 or CK56, any heavy chain. Right, like a few, yes. Yeah, perhaps that might also stay. Sure, yes. yes. And um, yeah, I mean, this triple stain, it's, it's a luxury to have that triple stain. Um, it, is a it takes a little bit longer to do that uh, immunostain. Uh, but it's useful. So, so this next um, is also a 53-year-old female with architectural distortion. And uh, any takers for this case? Mm -hmm. Few glands look. leading into the stroma, kind of like the last case, right? Um, hmm. And this immunostain, I've put this in the first picture itself. So um, here you also have this internal control. So this brown stain, which is the P63 nuclear stain and CK56 cytoplasmic stain, is staining the myopathial layer. And on the slow bar, you can also see that some of these glands here or the ducts, they lack a brown stain. So, another uh, H&E section slide uh, picture. This does not have any brown stain. So you see how similar these two cases look. Uh, again, such bland, bland appearing uh, ducts and glands. Uh, often they say in um, these, so what would you call this? I didn't want to give you the name. What is this? It's a low grade invasive carcinoma. How would you, can you give it a more specific name? I hear <laughs> tubular carcinoma, right? And they often say that in tubular carcinoma on the h &E section, sometimes you can, like some subtle findings that would perhaps take you in this direction, are that uh, you can find these uh, pointy looking glands, like over here. But, uh, you know, these cancers or the lesions don't read the books. So even in radial scars, we can sometimes find them, but just look out for those pointy uh, kind of glands. And um, for something like this, it's good to have a couple of myopathial cell markers. Myosin is another good one. 
um, because you know you don't want to label a patient with cancer if it's not truly really cancer. Luckily, in this, both micro and myosin work really well. So uh, here again, this pointy looking bland, very bland glands, and then the myosin lack of myosin. So this is a tubular carcinoma. Okay. Now this one was an MRI guided biopsy in a 65 year old female. And this was a non-mass enhancement. So here, um, this looks somewhat like the previous two cases with you know dense cytoplasm and these bland appearing ducts kind of just radiating out from the center. So this, at least on the H and E, somewhat looks like a radial scar, right? So this biopsy was a very busy one. There was marked proliferative changes that could be seen. Um, in this biopsy, literally every benign you know, lesion that is described could be seen in this biopsy. So here, um, you know, this introductal proliferation of cells, a lot of overlapping. Some of the nuclei look quite ugly. So something like this, you know, you, you begin to think, is this, you know, worse than just moderal, uh, moderate uh, usual ductal hypoplasia? Could this be maybe DCIS? Are we looking at DCIS? Uh, but in DCIs, usually the cells are much more monomorphic. It's kind of opposite to many other tumors, right? In breast, monomorphism is, is not considered good, right? So, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, so here, we, of course, employed a um, lot of stains uh, for the markers, so my myosin. Here, you see this moderate uh, kind of the proliferation. So there was adenosis, there was moderate UDH. And uh, in adenosis, you want to, again, make sure there is uh, myosin, uh, myopathial cell marker uh, positivity, and uh, micro eye also. So in uh, moderate UDH, usual ductal hypoplasia, the micro eye stain is very useful because the intraductal proliferation of the cells, all those epithelial cells, show this brown staining with the CK56 which in an ADH or atypical ductal hypoplasia, you will only see pink. So inside would be just pink, and then you would see the intact P63 myopathial cell uh, positivity around the duct, but inside the duct, it will be negative. So the, it, inside the duct, it's all magenta. But in UDH, the usual ductal hypoplasia with the triple stain, or you can even employ just single, you know, CK56 staining, it's very useful because in moderate usual ductal hypoplasia, the intraductal proliferation will show CK56 strong positivity. So we find this CK56 stain very useful when you are trying to decipher is this just moderate usual ductal hypoplasia or not. And um, so like here you see, so this was UDH involving a radial scar. Right? You can have all these, you know, proliferative changes involving a radial scar. And this adenosis can form somewhat like a tumor. So it will be adenosis, somewhat nodular, and you can say consistent with adenosis tumor. And that's what they are picking up by imaging also. So this is the micro eye stain. And here in these uh, pictures, you see that the intraductal proliferation of the epithelial cells, they are showing CK5 positivity. Uh, so, which is a good thing. So, it tells us it's benign. Again, here, this is another example to show you um, how nice the CK516 is for these uh, to decipher whether this is um, just benign or atypical. Uh, this was almost looking like a ductal papillomatosis uh, within that region. So, you see, like just one biopsy, and you see all of these. So you want to include everything in there so they can correlate it with what they said, uh, saw by imaging. So um, what the radiologist does is they have their um, impression of what the lesion looks like just by imaging before the biopsy. Once we have done the biopsy and our report is out, um, they always correlate with what they saw. So if the imaging uh, does not really correlate with what we diagnose, we get a phone call. Or if we find something which does not make sense, um, you know, we always look at what the imaging or what the radiologist saw, and if it doesn't fit, we give them a phone call. Um, because you want to make sure that the lesion, the true lesion has been sampled. 
you know, you don't want to just say that, okay, you know, I have a biopsy and everything looks benign, everything is kosher and we sign it out. And then nobody, you know, follows it up. So, and then the lesion might still be there and perhaps the needle may have stuck, you know, a lesion right next to that. So you want to always correlate with what the radiologist saw. So it's always good to have a discussion uh, with your radiologist and you have to work very closely with them. So this is how we signed out the case um, for this particular biopsy. So uh, here's an example of a biopsy done for calcifications. And um, this one has uh, any uh, takers for this case? Feel free to just speak up. It's okay. It's okay to make mistakes. This is how we we'll learn, right? Nine? Can you give an example of what it is? showing the typical symptoms. And the glance of the is a pretty easier to make. Sure. Good. So, as you very rightly pointed out, they seem to have these apical snouts. So, uh, previously, when these lesions or, uh, were described, they uh, used to be called as columnar cell changes with apical snouts. So, now it's just called columnar cell change and hetoplasia. Right? Um, so, this is the main you know, finding in this. Once you have that background, now you look for is there atypia, right? So if you have a duct, uh, which is uh, like one of the ducts shown here, like an example, uh, if it's like a cookie cutter tight shape, um, your eyes will certainly go to that duct. Now look at the nuclei for those cells that are lining the duct. Uh, if the nuclei look very monomorphic, so instead of being just columnar, nice, you know, pencil shaped and stacked together, once they begin to get more round and monomorphic and kind of spaced out, so a single layer just surrounding these ducts, that's when you will call it as a flat epithelial atypia. So FEA arising in the background of columnar cell changes in hypoxia. The other thing uh, is uh, if these uh, lining cells begin to show any architectural uh, abnormalities like making little papillae, or making bridges, then you have to think about atypical ductal hypoplasia. You want to make sure that there's no atypical ductal hypoplasia. So in this particular uh, case, if you, you know, just look at the low power of this, so you have this uh, columnar cell changes, perhaps some flat epithelial atypia like we saw in this previous picture, like over here. Um, oh, and also in this, you see, look at the stroma, there's some Pseudoangiomatous stroma hypoplasia, also some PASH, some focal PASH. And PASH can, by imaging, um, look like a, like a mass. You know, sometimes we have uh, fibroadenomas, uh, or you can have PASH. And that also correlates with what they found by imaging. So, so it is important to recognize PASH also, pseudoangiomatous stroma hypoplasia, because then the radiologists can correlate. They say, yes, you know, that makes sense. If we did not mention PASH and there was PASH, then the radiologist would be at a loss. They would think that they missed the lesion. <laughs> In this particular um, uh, slide, we see this proliferation uh, of the cells within the duct, right? So now, we just looking at this picture, what would be your differential for this ductal proliferation? What are the things you're thinking of? Yes, atypical ductal hypoplasia. Anything else? Huh? DCIS, someone said, right? DCIS. So those are the main things, right? And um, now before labeling a patient with a diagnosis of carcinoma, right? And once a patient is diagnosed with carcinoma, it's stuck for life. So we want to be very, very careful, especially in these kind of, you know, uh, lesions that are at just the border, you know, this way or that way. And there will be a lot of inter-observer variability. So you want to minimize that. So that's why then they came up with some of these objective, you know, um, 
uh, cutoffs. So one was if the lesion is less than two millimeters, right, or if it is involving less than two ducts, then better call it ADH, not DCIS. But those uh, cutoffs and guidelines drop off if the nuclei are a high grade. If it really looks ugly, then it is DCIS, even if it's smaller. This particular case, the nuclei are very low grade. Okay, there's no mitoses to be found. Uh, there is very little uh, nuclear atopia. So, and this was measuring about 1.5 millimeters. So based on these criteria, we would call it as atypical ductal hypoplasia and not low-grade DCIS, okay? So, um, did someone say? No. So um, you want to be conservative. And if sometimes, you know, there'll be cases it's not on that um, white, you know, black and white, that this way or that way. Then you have to end up writing a long comment and saying, hey, you know, you can give your, like, although it's only involving, like, a single duct, but the nuclei are high grade and you're very worried about DCIS. So you want to put that in there. Uh, if you can't arrive at, you know, a diagnosis, a, a definitive diagnosis of DCIS or ADH. Um, similarly, in the, so in the top line for such cases, you can just say atypical intraductal proliferation, C note, or C comment. And then in the comment, you can mention that you find this, proliferation of ductal epithelial cells within, say, one or two ducts. Uh, the nuclei are of, like, intermediate grade. Uh, so your differential is ADH, but you're worried about DCI. So you can, it's okay to put that in your, uh, you know, comment section and on the report, instead of, like, hanging yourself, um, making a definitive diagnosis on such borderline lesions uh, in a biopsy. You can always, and then once you have the excision, you can always say what it was, okay? So this one um, also had some other atypical proliferations. So this is kind of a straightforward, right? So what is your diagnosis on this slide? So we have these small, tiny cells proliferating in a lobular fashion, and we have loss of ecoterin, right? So atypical lobular hypoplasia. So it's not lobular carcinoma in site two because for, for LCIS, you want to really have much more proliferation like than this. And um, like the entire lobule is completely overtaken by this proliferation of these lobular cells. Um, and even in those cases, your top line diagnosis can be, can be lobular neoplasia and then within parentheses, atypical lobular hypoplasia slash, slash lobular carcinoma in site two. So you include both in those. This one is only atypical lobular hypoplasia. The e coherent is very useful because sometimes, I mean, by H&E, you know, it can look like a lobular proliferation, but it turns out to be ductal. So you do want to get a stain uh, on e coherent. Um, sometimes if not much of tissue is left on the deeper levels by morphology, it looks like in ALH, call it. Okay, because morphology always trumps over in those. Uh, Another new stain that we have started employing is P120. Uh, this will stain your ALH uh, with a brown like, cytoplasmic staining. And the ductal cells, uh, ductal epithelial cells, will just show cytoplasmic staining. So e is a loss of staining. And P120, you will see positive staining. So sometimes it really helps out uh, in doing these stains. So uh, this particular uh, biopsy, which was done for calcifications, and here I say no separation because often uh, the radiologists will split the biopsies after they have taken the biopsy, they will split it as with calcifications and with no calcifications because after they take the biopsy, they also uh, do the imaging of the biopsies themselves to make sure that they have gotten the lesions that they were going after. And uh, if they, sometimes it does happen that the calcifications are not biopsied. And then, so they will make a note that they tried because, you know, the lesion can be very deep in the breast or in the, you know, region that's difficult to get to. So the post biopsy imaging uh, of the biopsy actual cores may not show the calcifications that they were going after and they'll make a note and then we'll also make a note, hey, you know, that we did not see the calcifications. 
the other thing that may happen is that although they got the calcifications, when we get our H and E sections on the initial levels, which you know up front we get three levels of the H and E sections. If on those first three sections we are not seeing the calcifications, we look at the imaging report, and if we find that the radiologist clearly says that they had the calcifications in the biopsy, we get further levels, deeper levels. We even, if we still don't see the calcifications, we image the block, the actual paraffin block. That way you have done your, you know, complete analysis and then you can confidently say, hey, you know, I really don't see the calcifications. Um, and sometimes it does happen that on the deeper levels, the calcifications show up and the lesion, which was not visible in the first three slides, you know, it shows up. So always get deeper levels when things don't make sense. Okay, so deeper levels are extremely helpful um, in any, you know, biopsy or excision. So always think of deeper levels. And uh, mention all the lesions that you see. Uh, they because this, they uh, will undergo excision if there's ADH, FEA, they are getting excisions. Although now there are like newer, you know, articles coming out that which say that perhaps we can be more conservative with such lesions. So if it's ADH, we can just perhaps follow them. So that's kind of coming out now. So just to minimize uh, surgeries and be more conservative. So going to the next case. Um, this was a tiny lesion in a 39-year-old female. Uh, it was somewhat irregular. Okay, now any takers for this one? Yes, no? Did you see this slide? You remember seeing this slide? So you can describe it. You can just describe what you're seeing. So you can say it looks... Hmm? That's a good description. Okay. That's a very good description. So you're seeing eosinophilic cytoplasm, um, apocrinish looking, right? We don't know whether they are apocrine cells or not, but they are apocrine like cells, right? And um, they have rather similar nuclei and all the cells, more or less. So a very pink looking lesion. What stain do you think this might be? What stains do you want? What is your differential on the h &E and what stains would you like? Hmm? So just looking at the, uh, so if you look at these cells, they're kind of large, they have abundant cytoplasm, they are eosinophilic. The nuclei look more or less similar in all these cells. Um, so you can think of, are these what? Histiocytes? Or are these epithelioid cells, epithelial cells? What are they? Right? Or something else? <clears throat> something neural like cells? Almost like ganglions, perhaps? We don't know what they are, right? So you want to get stains. What stains would you get? So for histiocytes? CD68 or 163, you can get that done. What stain do you think this is? Strong, positive. Any guesses? Just guess. Something neural. Uh, uh, S100. Okay. So this was strongly S100 positive and pancytokeratin, HMB45, and calretinin negative. S100 positive, and you know, and as you know, melanoma can mimic just about everything under the sun. And because it's S100 positive, so we threw in the HMB45 HB just to be complete. Um, although by H and E we you know, we were thinking of this particular lesion, but you always want to back up your uh, H&E diagnosis with immunostains if you can. So this was PAN-CK negative, okay, calretinin negative, and H&E 45 negative. So based on this, what is our diagnosis? Any takers? So this is something, it's not specific for the breast. You can see it in other sites also. Uh, and that's what you want to remember, that you can see it in the, in the breast. So uh, just because it's a breast does not mean that um, it's a lesion, you know, 
Uh, you will only thinking on the lines of ductal carcinoma or fibrodinoma, it can be something which is found in other regions, other regions of the body. So this was a granular cell tumor, a very cute finding, and I have a recut of that in our, uh, the box that I'm leaving here. I think you'll enjoy this case. We, we, we just get excited about these little, you know, cases um, that come through. So now this is a biopsy in a male. Uh, this is a periareolar uh, lesion uh, in a 70-year-old male. Did you all see this case? You remember this case? <laughs> Any takers for this one? You can describe what you see, like even if you did not see the uh, cases, because I know there was very little time in between. But if you um, can just describe here, that will be great also. No? Perfect. Okay, good. Uh, and these cells, they kind of look spindly, right? Do they? And they're somewhat, there's some mild atypia, not a whole lot. And then we have these sort of a collagen bands in between. Uh, so this is, again, we don't see this lesion too often, uh, but we do see it. And when you see it, you want to recognize it so that you don't, you know, we don't call it something sarcomatous or malignant or carcinomatous. So this was a, a rather bland uh, spindle cell proliferation interspersed by these collagen bands. And of course, we get the immunostains. And most importantly, it was positive for Desmond and CD34 and negative for PAN-CK, uh, SMA, S100. And there was also loss of RB, so retinoblastoma gene. So any uh, takers now? So this is a, this falls in that category of tumors with loss of RB, which is a tumor suppressor uh, gene. Any takers? No? So this is a myofibroblastoma uh, in a male patient, and mainly just that you should recognize it and think about it when you see it, okay? Uh, and it's, of course, a benign lesion, and all these patients do pretty well. Um, so uh, just to emphasize again, if you don't see the lesion on the initial levels, get deeper levels. Always look deeper. You will find the lesion most likely. Uh, if it's for calcifications and you don't see the calcifications, uh, you know, get levels. If you still don't see them, you can image the block and uh, see if there are calcifications left in the block. If there are, you can further go and get deeper levels. Sometimes if the lesion is very tiny, and you try to get immunostains, perhaps the further sections you get do not have the lesion. Another trick you can use is just destain this H&E slide and get, you can just get one stain on that and just get the one most important stain you can, and then you can uh, prove or disprove your um, findings. Uh, always correlate with imaging, with the clinical history, um, and just speak with the, the radiologist if things don't make sense. Um, similarly, uh, another thing, you know, I have uh, another case uh, I've added in that box uh, was some, uh, you know, benign breast biopsy with secretory changes. And that can really look very um, scary under the microscope. And, you know, you may begin to think about cancer on those cases, especially if it's not a patient who's post lactational, you know, who's lactational. Because you can think of the secretory changes if it's a woman who has just given birth to a baby and she's in that phase, then you would think, okay, you know, this could be secretory changes. But if it's a patient uh, who does not have this, you know, uh, history and she's of an older age, she can still have these secretory changes because of some drugs that she may be taking, some medications. So those can form, um, cause these secretory changes. So always keep that in mind, drug-induced secretory changes or like lactational-like secretory changes in these biopsies. But we don't want to call it cancer. And uh, I sometimes put this on my microscope, don't rush, you know, if it's, um, it's you know, a weird-looking case, 
um, just pause, take a pause, show your colleagues, get consult, um, and sleep over it. And the next morning, sometimes you, know, you just get the answer. And um, again, when speaking with Preeti, we were talking about excisions of breast. So just a very quick note about um, how we approach these excisions. Um, how much time do I have? 20 minutes? OK. And I'll just follow with the next, uh, so I'll just you know, complete everything within that time. Um, so all the excisions, um, you know, first we get these oriented by the surgeon, so short superior, long lateral, and then we have these wire uh, guided excision. And then uh, we ink it um, with six colors. And so the you know, easiest way to remember is blue like the sky, green like the grass. Um, but at our hospital, we are doing it in a different way, the medial lateral, where I trained at MD Anderson, we were doing the, you know, superior blue and then green. But whatever, you know, uh, color you want to choose, you can do that. Black, deep, and uh, the yellow is the inferior. So you ink it, and then you slice. We are submitting the entire excision if it's small enough, especially for all the cancer cases. Uh, because even if you can see the lesion, uh, if it's, for example, if it's a DCIS, the DCIS may be away from the main, you know, area which was biopsied. So we uh, do submit the entire excised specimen, and this way we are able to orient and exactly say where the lesion is, what margins are positive, which ones are close. Um, so we find this very useful. And then we submit it in the blocks, uh, and the PA will mention exactly, you know, what slice has been submitted in which block. So we are able to reconstruct the whole specimen in a 3D manner and tell the surgeon exactly where, what margin is close. So, so thank you very much, and if you, would, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Uh, otherwise, I can go on to the, some updates on breast pathology. Uh, so hope you will find the slides useful. And um, I, there's one case uh, in that box, which is closer to Dr. Gujral's uh, area. And so this was a um, older woman who had a mass in her breast. Uh, she got the biopsy. It looked like a, the initial stains looked like a triple negative, you know, high-grade carcinoma. Um, and, you know, there's always something... <laughs> you know, tells you that it's just not looking right. So it threw in the pan-CK and CD45, and lo and behold, it was a lymphoma, high-grade B-cell, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. So I have put that biopsy also in the box. So something to remember, to keep in mind, if it's a, you know, if it's something that looks like a high-grade triple negative breast carcinoma, think what else could it be? Think lymphoma, okay, and just throw in CD20, CD3 stains on that. Uh, it will save our life. <laughs> so, okay, so I can go to the next. Um, can we open the next presentation? So, do you often see these lesions that? like myofibroblastomas, granular cells. So just a brief update, you know, and because uh, every year there's something new that comes up uh, based on, you know, we learn new things as we study more lesions. And then we have to come up with the updates. Um, so some of the updates have been in the morphological subtype categories and some in just the reporting of the prognostic and predictive biomarkers. Um, so we start with the morphological subtype updates. Um, so in the past, uh, some of these uh, distinct subtypes, like the oncocytic, lipid-rich, glycogen-rich, clear cell, sebaceous carcinomas with carcinomatous uh, and pleomorphic patterns, melanocytic and osteoclast like stromal giant cells. So these are now all under this category of invasive breast carcinoma of no special type. Uh, 
Okay, and you can see this in the CAP cancer protocol also that this is how it's, it has been uh, named. Um, in your, you know, once, I mean, you'll put it under this category, but in the comment, you can always, you know, describe what you're seeing, right? Because uh, if, this, if this cancer metastasizes and if it's like the osteoclast-rich uh, carcinoma, and in the metastases, that's what they are seeing. So you always want to have that in your initial report so that they know, okay, this, this had these giant cells, and it's not something new that is coming up. Uh, similarly, with medullary carcinoma, so medullary carcinoma or atypical medullary carcinoma, so all these will now be under the category of invasive breast carcinoma with medullary pattern. So these are the carcinomas with, uh, that are uh, T-cell uh, lymphocyte-rich carcinomas, and they tend to have better prognosis. Uh, so this is uh, how they now recommend it to be worded. Uh, some new subtypes, which I have not yet seen a case of this, um, you know, tall cell carcinoma with reverse polarity in the breast yet. Uh, it's more like what is described in the thyroid and similarly mucinous cyst adenocarcinomas. So these are some newer entities. So, we, you know, once we see them, uh, we'll probably be, you know, following them this way. In the uh, updates in the ER and progesterone receptor, um, so progesterone <coughs> testing is no longer kind of mandatory in DCIS. You can just do ER. Um, so that's something that has been proposed. Uh, another thing is the ER low positive breast cancer. So this is a recommendation for the reporting. So when we report out cases in which the estrogen receptor was just 1 to 10 percent, um, then this is the wording that they recommend that we put so that the oncologists know, you know, about these benefits, about the therapies. Um, so again, nothing different from the aspect of how to count or anything, but it's just for the reporting for the low. And of course, less than one percent is zero uh, is a negative um, ER. So this is for the reporting, and you can uh, we have actually created just a quick text or smart text. For such cases, so whenever we have a case with a low ER positivity, uh, we just insert that quick text under the comment section. What else is new? So PDL1. It seems like now everyone is asking for PDL1 testing for every carcinoma, every malignancy. Is it happening here too? They're asking for PDL1. So, uh, of course, now we have PDL1 testing in breast carcinoma also. We are not doing PDL1 staining at our institute because we find that, you know, there's always some new recommendations coming up, the cutoffs, the validations. Um, so, we are sending it to a centralized lab and um, they do the assessment of the PDL1. Uh, but because, you know, if, if you are going to do it in house, we need to know. Uh, what drug is the oncologist planning on using because the cutoffs uh, are different for uh, these drugs because they are based on the different trials and they are drug specific. So uh, we just have to keep that in mind uh, when doing the PDL1 testing and reporting in house. So, as I mentioned, so how does it affect the pathologist? Uh, we need to know what drug the oncologist is planning to use, what cutoffs to use. Um, and, uh, of course, uh, it's still kind of, you know, we are learning from these different tumors. So the standard, uh, it's really not all standardized yet, and it will keep changing. Uh, with KI-67, uh, we do KI-67 staining in all our invasive breast carcinomas. Uh, so ER, PR, HER2, KI-67. And the main thing to uh, just keep in mind is that that category of, you know, when you're going to call it 20%, so if you go 18 or 15 percent versus 25 percent, um, the therapy may be a little bit different. So we just want to be cautious when we are in that, uh, you know, uh, whether 20 percent less or more. So um, that's all in the updates. So thank you for your attention. And uh, I hope you find the slides useful uh, and look at them later also. There are numbers written on them and I can always send the reports for those cases later on. So thank you for your attention. Yes.
No, we don't. No, this is not a cutoff. Yeah, this is not a cutoff. So we, for KI67, we just mention, we don't say negative, positive for KI67. We just give a percent. <laughs> So this 20%, the only reason I mention it, 20% is because of the drug uh, abimaclip, uh, uh, abimaciclip, which is a kinase inhibitor, they make the decision of whether or not to give this drug based on the KI67 level. So it's really, otherwise it's really no cutoff for low, high, nothing, low proliferation, high proliferation. Drug. So we don't mention, um, you know, that it's the KI67 is negative if it's less than this or positive if it's more than that. Um, we only mention the percent <coughs> that 5% of the tumor cells are positive or 80% of the tumor cells are positive or give a, you know, like about 50 to 60% of the tumor cells are positive so that no matter where this report goes, uh, because, you know, patients can go to different uh, cancer centers to get their treatment. So no matter where it goes, they know what exact percent is. So for the ERPR, you mean? Yes, for ERPR, yes, like everywhere else. So, no, so we are uh, we are not like um, just based on ERPR. You mean subtype as low or high proliferation? Yes. Is that what you're saying? Is a low proliferation or high proliferation? No. So we, I mean, if it's a 80 to 90 percent, we'll call it high. You know, high proliferation uh, scene, and you can mention 80 to 90 percent. But something like this, we don't necessarily say low or high. I think she wants to, the question is regarding the cut of the case, 67 and the differentiate between the level of A and the level of B. Oh, no, so we are not doing that. Exactly. Correct, we are not doing that. Yes. I think most practically we are sending for the combo Yes, so we send, uh, so again that comes from the clinician, if they want it to be sent or not. Um, so we don't, you know, decide that, okay, we are going to send it for oncotype DX. So it's the, if the clinician wants to send it, then we send, and then of course, then you get the, you know, it's like a multi-gene, they look at the multiple genes, and then they come up with an occurrence score. Yeah. So only in those cases, yes. Yeah. So. From the case of a glandular cell tumor based S1 what other differentials are considered in that case apart from the So sometimes like these um, epithelioid cells can look like this, like epithelial cells. So, uh, but those would be pancytokeratin positive. So you, you want to make sure it's not um, like a carcinoma. So that's another thing. Or xanthoma. So just lipid rich. So histiocytes could be positive. Sometimes if a patient has had um, either a previous procedure or a biopsy uh, or some treatment or say fat necrosis, then these histiocytes can sometimes, you know, just conglomerate and look, begin to look like this. So those are the some things that you want to keep in mind. Because you also have this histiocytoid appearing invasive lobular carcinomas or invasive carcinomas. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I mentioned the calretinin, right? It may be, yeah. Should have taken it out. So. Thank you. So thank you. So. Begin with the super interaction. Sure, please. And don't be shy. Maybe. Let's see. 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 Let's see.
<laughs> so once Punjabi invites American home and cooks 15 dishes and tells the American, Aap sharmaiye mat aur khaiye. <laughs> then American invites Punjabi as a return, you have to invite now. She is, sorry, not she. American invites the Indi Punjabi home and she says, Sharam to aapko hai nahi khaiye. <laughs> Aap sharmaiye. Poochiye. On the FNAs, um, sometimes, you know, if you see like a ductal proliferation, um, yes, you can, but it's difficult. So you can just see like three dimensional clusters of these ductal epithelial cells. Uh, which will be more than what you would just see in, say, if it's a cyst aspiration. Okay, so then you can see multiple clusters, but I would be extremely careful of calling it, say, ADH on that, unless if you have a great uh, welcome, Newton and Freud, so Namaskar, yes. No, no, so it's a pleasure to have you here, so thank you. So if there's a cell block, you know, which is very cellular, and if you can see the architecture of the ductal epithelial cell proliferation, then in very rare cases, you may be able to see that, uh, you know, there's ADH, but I would be extremely careful. Uh, all we could say is that there is hyperplasia of the ductal epithelial cells, and you can suggest that, you know, correlate with the imaging and clinical, and if needed, uh, get a biopsy. So, for confirmation, the biopsy should be done and uh, for more confirmation. For? For confirmation of... Yes, yes, you can, it's okay to do that. It's okay if, you know, if we don't know exactly what it is on the FNA, because uh, you will not see all the features of ADH, right, on that. So, yeah, it's okay to say. All you can say is that there's some ductal hyperplasia and, and then leave it open. Welcome. Um, so the reason we are calling it um, as granular cells because it's positive for S100 and it's like a neural differentiation. So in your description, you can say that they're oncocytic type because they are pink, and that's all, right? It's kind of a h &E sort of a description. So you can describe it like that. Correct, yes. So it's on, based on the ISC. And by h &E also, like if we were, like if a gun was put to my head and, and there was no immunostains, then you can still say, you know, it, it looks like a grand or so, yeah.
try harder for better. However, the achievements may need to be acknowledged. Hence, I would like to call on stage our respected head, Professor U.S. Singh, to, depart, to present the concise annual report of the Department of Pathology for the year 2022.
that pathologist has to be a good clinician first, having enough knowledge of disease in detail, then only the pathologist will be able to make a final diagnosis. With the God's grace, we all faculty, residents, staff and employees would put our best efforts to excel, to update ourselves with the current recent advances in pathology and achieve pinnacle of success and we aim that the sky is our limits of progress and achievement in the field of pathology. I thank on behalf of the Department of Pathology all of you for coming and for this here. Thank you. Our gratitude is endless for all our media teachers, technicians, staff, employees for the contribution. We feel proud of the legacy, heritage, great reputation in teaching, patient care, and research. I request all our dignitaries on the dais. A good leader is a person who takes care a little more than his share of blame and a little less than his share of credit. And I believe that everyone here agrees that our current Vice Chancellor not only stands correct to the above statement but has gone far and beyond to maintain but uplift the glory of this institute. I now request Honorable Vice Chancellor Lieutenant General Dr. Vipin Puri to enlighten us with his valuable words of wisdom. Some broad, broad guidelines of how this a vision statement of how the 
departments of Rome, and uh, we can't really thank them enough for giving giving us the institution, the department, what they have. It is also time to look at an introspect of what, uh, where you stand today, what is your present, how would you want to analyze your uh, strengths, your weaknesses, your opportunities, and your challenges. So I think it is in that context, and then of course, do a crystal gaze of how you would want your future. How would you want to, where do you want to take your department? And um, I think it is uh, uh, a, a good occasion where uh, we can introspect and try and uh, uh, do an analysis of where we actually are. So I'm very, very happy with the way that the department has progressed in the year gone by. I have been following it up very, very closely. I know in, in, in terms of a um, very dynamic head of the department who is so passionate about everybody, whether it's the staff, the faculty, the, the residents, the students, the employees, the infrastructure. So, um, actually, we are very blessed in this university to have uh, Professor Guru Singh. Um, I am aware that it's a very busy department, constantly catering to the demands and supplies of the entire college, university, 24-7 pathology services, including the chemical laboratory and what have you, constantly trying to upgrade infrastructure resources, high-end equipment, and of course, uh, the, the keeping attack, uh, the, to, uh, ensuring that the investigations are uploaded through the, the laboratory information system into the various water departments, more importantly, the ICU setting where it's critical that we put in these interesting results as early as possible. So very happy, very pleased that the system is working. To me, that's most very, very important. Very happy also to see that the research, uh, as much as we keep doing our patient care, laboratory care, infrastructure facilities, upgrading maintenance of the equipment, etc., etc., very happy to see that uh, there have been 60 publications from this department in the year gone by. So very, very credible, very, very happy to see that. Um, six uh, intra and extra mural projects are ongoing, which is again a credit to the department. I was very pleased to know that the, uh, the electron microscopy is also back into gear and is uh, is now a, a functional. One of the challenges which was given the last foundation day was turnaround times, and and uh, I was very pleased to, to hear from Professor Yu saying that the turnaround time has uh, has come down very substantially. Um, uh, as far as uh, drop D and drop I is concerned, it's about thirty minutes, as well as for further sections and. Uh, ABGs about 10 to 20 minutes. What is it still a challenge is uh, um, whether you can do the FNACs and histopathologies in as much time because I know there are the issues of your microtomes and your staining techniques and your histochemistry and immunohistochemistry and what have you and then and uh, these, when these girls come to me and say, so the skip is not there and that is not there. I understand that those are the issues, but having said that, it is something that you have to work out in your own system that um, the turnaround time, even for FNAC and anthropology, uh, requires to be looked at. So I'm very, very happy also to see that uh, uh, the department has excelled in. Uh, uh, has been acknowledged at different levels. Um, so here I see some book chapters have been contributed by um, um, many of the faculties, by the Vidhi, Dr. Preeti, Chanchal, uh, Shivanjali, and uh, Shalini <coughs> Hala um, received a certificate of successful completion in the bronze course of medical education in November of uh, last year. And this is from the NMC, which is a, actually a, a very, very important one.
our um, guest lectures on the national platform. Very happy to see this, that most of you are contributing. Rashmi, Atin, Riti, Vahid Ali, Priti, Shivanjali, and Geeta. And Dr. Atin Singhai was awarded the International Goods Society of Nephrology um, Certificate Fellowship in 2021. And Dr. Vahid Ali awarded the best poster presentation in the pre clinical category in the annual research showcase of 2022. And Preeti Agarwal got the uh, Etsy Royal Pathologist of the Year Award from the IMA Lucknow in 2022. Very, very pleased, delighted for each and every one of you. It means a lot to the university as you all in your personal good stories. Um, Besides this, I'm also told that there are many residents who have done exceptionally well at, um, uh, for the department. So uh, without naming them, but let me say this, that um, the college, the university is proud of each and every one of you. Um, also, um, to the uh, chemical laboratory that they have added newer investigations, cellular plasma levels, copper, urinary copper, calcarenin activities, allosterone, IgG, IgM, IgE levels, um, newer in, as well as in the molecular lab, uh, HPV, EGFR and PCRs, and uh, mutation analysis by fish, ALK mutation analysis by fish. Uh, um, lots of instrument, uh, instrumentation, uh, uh, thanks to the University Administration, UP Shasan Kidenti, and RT PCR machines, head microscopes, flow cytometry, and automated tissue microbes. Very happy that we have been able to uh, upgrade our basic infrastructure for quality uh, uh, management at, in the department. I'm, I'm aware that it, the department is very, uh, once again, equipment intensive, and uh, we have uh, always strived to ensure that we maintain, a, uh, we, as far as the maintenance of your basic equipment is ensured. And uh, I was bringing, uh, bringing out the figures, five crores is what we have invested in this department in terms of infrastructure in the last few years. Uh, I was, I'm very, very pleased at the way the department was absolutely passionate to upgrade its museum. And I'm so happy with the, with the, with the final product. And I once again congratulate the health department and the faculty for getting this around. So, um, so I wish, once again, I wish the entire department, the faculty, the residents, um, a great foundation day, a lot of learning, and I wish you all a very productive year ahead in the time to come. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Dhanyavad, sir. Namaskar, I am Dr. Pankaj Gautam, junior resident, Pathology Puhaki Hose. Here we are all in the city, and 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 all in the city. जैसा कहते हैं कि हर विभाग की नींव उसके फैकल्टी रेजिडेंट और स्टाफ से बनती है इसलिए आज हम अपने विभाग के कर्मचारी वसुंधरा जी का अभिवादन करना चाहते हैं जिन्होंने बहुत ही निष्ठा से अपना कार्य किया और अपने जीवन के अमूल्य बस इस विभाग को दिए मैं वसुंधरा जी से अनुरोध करूंगा कि वो मंच पर आए और सम्मान ग्रहण करें मैं मत दिस पॉइंट आई वुड लाइक टू टेल वन थिंग दैट वसुंधरा मिश्रा मैडम हैज बीन वेरी इंस्ट्रूमेंटल in setting up the population lab along with the Ashkosh to Marcel.
Due to the ongoing natural section, our respected guest, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Lieutenant General Dr. Vipin Puri, Pro VC, Professor Vineet Sharma, and Dean of Athletics, Professor A.P. Tripathi, will come to eat the occasion early. I am extremely grateful to them for gracing this occasion and I request our respected head to please present our medal to our respected guest. Thank you. 
That is why it is said, Sapan Bhum Sudat Hai, Sundari Sikh. The path you take will not be easy. It will not be straightforward. It will not even be laid out for you. You will have to carve your own path. On the way, we will fall and face failures, but that is how we will learn and we will grow. Stephen King said about rejections that he used to put a nail in the wall on which to hang rejection slips from publishers. When the nail in the wall could no longer support the weight of the rejection slips, he replaced the wall with a spike and went on writing. So, in life, never quit, never give up. I too once sat where you are, listening to lectures, and solving every bit of Kumar and Robbins, trying to understand the hows and whys of the diseases. I soon realized that the actual learning starts after we have completed our formal training and we step into the real world. In our practice of pathology, since we mostly see patients' samples and not the patients themselves, it is important to remember that there's a patient, a human being, behind every sample. I'd first like to welcome Professor Kiki Agarwal, who was also one of my teachers during my training. So welcome, Ma'am Agarwal. Namaskar. And um, as I was just saying that behind every sample, we should remember there's a human being and that their treatment in life depends on our diagnosis. If there is any doubt regarding a diagnosis, show the case to your colleagues, get their opinion, send it for a consult. There is no place for big egos. During my residency training at the University of Texas Medical Branch at Galveston, fellowships at the Andy Anderson Cancer Center in Houston and at the Harvard Medical School in Boston, and my experience as a research scientist at the Whitehead Institute at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology or MIT, I had the opportunity to work with those whose books we study during our medical training those who are stalwarts in their fields, and those who have been nominated for Nobel Prizes. These were some of the biggest names in the world, and yet, these people were so grounded, and they interacted with humility. Just as the saying goes, when the tree is laden with fruit, it bends down. If there was a difficult case, they did not hesitate to say, I don't know and their egos were not hurt if a student or a trainee or a junior faculty came up with an answer. I learned some of the best lessons in life from them. So, know what you don't know and don't hesitate to ask and get a consult. A patient's life is at stake. If you make a mistake, and we all will make a mistake, because we are, after all, humans. Learn from them and correct them. Don't let your ego come in between. <clears throat> Have a strong ego, but not a big one. The practice of medicine is both a science and an art. When arriving at a diagnosis, check the clinical history, look at the imaging, and if the pathology diagnosis does not make sense, <coughs> Always ask yourself, what else could it be? Discuss the case with the clinician if it's something unusual. In surgical pathology, if the initial PGE sections don't show the lesion, get deeper levels of the thyroid box. Utilize minimalistic chemical stains as needed and show the case to your colleagues. Work hard. Because as Thomas Edison said, there is no substitute for
for hard work and always do the right thing. Don't be attached to the results. Follow the mantra from Bhagavad Gita, Karmani Bhagavata Raste, Mahaleshu Kadaja. Compete with yourself, not with others, and work towards making a better version of yourself. Remember that there will always be someone better than you. As a doctor and a good human being, have empathy. All of us in this room have been very lucky to receive the education that we did. The path that each one of us takes may be quite different. Yet, there are certain things that no matter where we go and no matter what we become, help shape a better life for ourselves and for those around us. I hope that the lessons I learned and shared with you will help you too. Once again, I wish you the best of life as you follow your heart and live your dreams. I leave you with Mahatma Gandhi's quote, live as though you were to die tomorrow and learn as you were to live forever. Thank you. Now I would request Professor Lashmi Kushwana to honor Dr. Ashutosh. Thank you. 
Sahara. In that era, the tests were completely manual and were performed with the homemade reagents like thromboplastic and partial thromboplastic made from human brain retrieved from archery and thrombic made from the blood bank plasma. The term PTPC survives from that era, although PTPC is still being used by some clinicians because of its rhyming nature. The term PT, APTT, TT are still in use, although tests like thromboplastic generation test, that is PGT, for diagnosis of hemophilia have turned obsolete now. The diagnosis of hemophilia with these reagents continued up to mid 80s and 90s, and the advent of semi automated cognometer analyzers based upon commercial reagents totally revolutionized the population scenario. In the current era, automated cognometers and digitalization has revolutionized the diagnostic measures. Aforementioned faculties like Dr. Dinkar Chandra, Dr. MRS Kushwar, Dr. Ashutosh Kumar, present faculty like myself, Dr. Bilijan, Dr. Geeta Yadav, and Dr. Sanjay Mishra, along with the Kusumata Mishra Madam, who have been very instrumental in setting up the population lab. These people have carried forward the names of now famous as state of art population lab. I must not forget to mention the name of Devendra, who has been a very hard tech working technician. The current lab is also linked with the Hemophilian Federation of India, which has been instrumental in granting aid in earlier years of development. With the efforts of current faculty, the facility for diagnosis of non malignant disease and other rare factor deficiencies will also be made available shortly. Thank you. This was on behalf of Professor Ashutosh Kumar. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Now we have in relation by Professor Sumi Kushal, someone who needs no introduction. There is no pathology resident in India or in fact outside the country who is familiar with the OTP PGP that is online teaching group for postgraduate in pathology. So, who is a professor at the Department of Pathology, Tata Memorial Hospital in Mumbai, is the co founder of this educational platform. Benefiting the pathology residents all over the world. Thank you, Sir, for this initiative. Sir has special interest in pathology and hematopathology and will be taking this duration on what's new in WHO hematopathology classification. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me here. It's an honor to be here and immense pleasure to be with you all. I'm seeing some of my old friends and, and the beautiful girl that we are here. My um, oration uh, is not on the WHO classification, it's on the online teaching program which we started. I'd just like to share our experiences, how we started it and where we have reached. So can I have my first slide please? WHO thing was the second thing. I thought I'll give a talk on WHO because I was unlucky to be part of the editorial team of the new WHO classification of Kenya from the blue book. But I was told Hodgkin's written. Okay, thank you. I give a chance to Hodgkin's also. So the title of my this uh, oration today is Changing Paradigms in Teaching Methodologies. So this English is a little complicated. And further complicated by OTPPGP. I'll try to make it simple. Many of the students might know it, few of us might not know it. What is it? So, pandemic, we all suffered. Most of families, most of our families suffered. We lost very dear, dear ones in this pandemic. But one good thing in this bad time happened was we started this online teaching program. Uh, it was, we saw that it was a complete shutdown. Point it was a complete shutdown of the formal teaching program in all medical schools. You know, we didn't know what is happening, so doctors were running around, hospitals were almost empty, 25% stands working. Now, PGs were deployed in COVID duties. Many PGs were sick themselves with their family members. And all meetings cancelled, obviously, meetings cancelled. And there was some need of starting a program. And how do you do it? Learn from home. Now, this is a true story. One of my residents, he's now in Memorial Sloan Catherine. He's a, doing one year fellowship there with Amit Dobbin. His name is Roman Sartana. He used to tell me, sir, we should have online classes year before the COVID started. 
So I said, who will do online? It's such a boring thing to do online. You can't see the students face to face. The thing is, online is, you don't enjoy it. And this is the, because you only talk, you crack a joke, and you like to see the response of the audience. Online, you do not know if somebody is listening to you. So I never gave a serious thought to Rohan's ideas. But when COVID started, he and another resident of mine, Satya, Satya is outside, outside India now, they suggested we should do an online talk on them for us. So what they did is Zoom link for me, so I had to give a talk. And surprisingly, we collected almost 96 students. So we're very happy. Okay, 96 students came to listen to a talk online at a very short notice. So then we met all of you, Monita Gorgeous. So she's a very dear friend. I'm very lucky to have her as a friend. Uh, and she has a mind of, uh, and, uh, of her own. And she's phenomenal. So I spoke to her, Anita, can we have this? She said, okay, we'll have surgical path. Uh, my other friends, you might know some guy, Kunal Sagar, another guy is like uh, Subramanian. They said, you know, so we do hematopath. Hematopathologists were interested in hematopath. Anita was interested in surgical path. I requested, we should do complete path. So this is Satya. And this guy is Rohan there, this new mask. So this is at the time of epidemic. The other few of the residents, this is Prashant is the consultant. The rest all are residents. There was no wife there. So now, uh, I just tell you briefly how it happened. So 11th, we, uh, we do every year open course for young pathology students, basic hematopathology course. We've been for the last 10, 15 years. And 11th course was supposed to happen in 2020, July. Now we have to cancel that. So we had to cancel that, then we thought we'll do online. <coughs> and then Rohan Satya met. And in April 2020, we, the whole group, I mentioned the names, mainly Anita, me, Paul, and Shweta, and then 10, 12 more of my colleagues, 15, 16 of us, we met. And we decided we'll do a complete path. We'll make a curriculum base. Curriculum means we'll take the whole province book and start from the biology till the techniques. Biology, general path, systemic path, cytopath, hematopath, molecular, and all techniques. Techniques means staining, grossing, autopsies, cutting, <coughs> molecular flow, genomics. So what we did, this was in April. So we thought we'll do a trial for two to three months, whether this is possible to do it or not. So you have any study you do, a big study, you have to do it, a small trial. So what we did, we did three months trial and we did one speaker from Patna, one speaker from Delhi, then we had one chairperson from Jammu to see whether this online things work, can we work like this, sitting in different places, because it's going to be a long program for two years and we'll have many speakers, many chairpersons, many moderators. It worked very well. And we hired an uh, app called, we hired Webinar Jam. There are many uh, webinar apps available. Zoom is one, like we use the common one. We hired Webinar Jam. It was very cheap. So then what we thought, uh, then when I wrote to one of my friends in Ames, Dr. Ayer, where he's the head of the department there, he says to me, I, have, I need a letter of invitation. So now, me and Anita cannot send a letter of invitation because we, it has to be through an institute. <coughs> so then we thought we'll go with the Tata Trust. Some society or some trust has to be there. So we got it sponsored by Tata Trust. And Tata Trust is sponsoring us the fees of the webinar channel, which is $600 in a year. So money was not the issue. The issue was um, a society or a trust associated with you so that if somebody wants a letter of invitation, because uh, when the Zoom started, Initially, people were allowed to give talks, but after six months, few institutes, the deposition committee started a rule, you have to take even permission for online talks. So you need permission for that. So we started our formal program from July. So April, May, June, we did three months teaching. And July, we made it uh, kind of an advertisement and put the whole program. So curriculum, as I told you, we made Excel sheets, we had chapters, let's say we have a lung chapter. Lung chapter had five talks. Lymphomas, five talks. GI, six talks. So we made chapters, head and neck, five talks. So we included talks, we included side seminars, we had general clubs, CPCs, and we used to do, we have been doing, still doing workshops on Saturdays. So one Saturday, after every two months, we used to have a workshop on cytogenetics, molecular, statistics, flow. It, like, 
uh, opportunities abroad. We had one session on that. And then we had to select speakers. Now, how do you select speakers? You know, you can't uh, generally select, selection of speakers is the most tricky and most difficult. But then we had a good group and we used to brainstorm why this person. And uh, so if I, I cannot invite my friend for a talk, even if my friend is good, my friend has to be the best. So there are seven, eight of us, we sit together and decide on the speaker. We may be still going wrong on some selections, but we tried to get the best speakers whom we thought are the best. And there was nothing, uh, because we wanted to give to the students. And our target was not KGMU actually that time, not Tata, not Games, not PGI. Our target was mainly smaller colleges where there is lesser education, lesser uh, infrastructure, no equipments, and not much stress is coming. There are many medical colleges in India, there's, they don't do kidney biopsy, they don't do brain biopsy, they don't do liver biopsy, they don't do bone marrow biopsy. So when you look at it, they do very few tissues. So the students come out of MD without so reading the books and seeing the pictures on the Google or books or the boxes. They never see the cases. So our target was less privileged colleges where they do not have good infrastructure and equipment, resources and maybe less teachers. So keeping that in mind, we made a very simple curriculum, which is very practical. So the points that I'll read it for you. So we started a virtual collaborative curriculum based long-term pathology planning portal. This is a map where we have the uh, objectives. Work. It's an online medium and it is a supplement. It is not PG, nothing can replace the PG teaching. PG students have to work in the department. They have to work in emergency, they have to work in crossing group, they have to work in um, an ad, uh, or autopsy, they have to work in reporting. So that cannot be replaced. This is just a small, small supplement. I should have written a small supplement because the learning is only in the department of pathology. These the students are into marrow. Many teaching programs are available online and they do not enjoy MDBS. They start preparing for MD. When they join MD, they start preparing for the DM. Like uh, Sumita said, enjoy the journey. The destination is not important. You reach there. But our pressures are so much now. I got a mail from a young student. Sir, why don't you make it something like narrow? I do not know what is narrow. I hope you know it. Seniors might not know. Though juniors will tell you. Do you know what is narrow? <laughs> this is a this is a teaching program. Students take these courses. This so this. So I will have to ask you guys later. But there are teaching courses. This so you join MBBS, you start. MD preparation. You join MD, you start DM preparation. So basically you don't enjoy it, you're not working, you're not doing anything there. So this is not an MD program, this is a small supplement to you in case you don't have these things available. It became popular after that because we, we never realized it become so popular. We started with only our target audience was, I repeat, smaller medical colleges, even private medical colleges and those government colleges which do not have good infrastructure. So plug gaps, those talks which are not done, those areas which are not covered in colleges, uniformity, it might help in some kind of uniformity in reporting systems, expose PGs to the best teachers. So we tried, update pathologists and private practice also. So in case the private practitioners who had finished their MD, they wanted to practice, they want to learn urine examination, CBCs, you know, how to analyze the plots, three part for cell counters, five part cell counters, they can learn. Upgrade the knowledge and skill of teachers. Now this is extremely important. So the most benefit was like I I never studied in MD, but I have started learning now. In my MBBS, I never learned. But now I have learned so much. I I, I chat with Dr. Uh, Madhu here. We we attend almost all talks. So many teachers here I know who are attending talks. So teachers are learning. It's not that only students are learning. And maybe we are privileged because we are lucky to be in better institutes, but the teachers from smaller institutes are learning. So the the benefits of this kind of programs are far. Because the teachers learn, they obviously go back, they try to implement that in their practice and the students learn. So the principles were many, but quickly I'll go through. I've already repeated a supplementary program. It should reach as many students as possible. It should be comprehensive, involve experts. I mean, when you say experts, not from games and PGI and TMH and the law. They can be from private labs. But they should be good, they should be working in that lab, they should know how to deliver, what to deliver. Like, who, who can talk about three parts cell counter, maybe five part? The one who is working, who knows the costing, how much it costs to give a three part, how much are the, what are the issues. So, based on that, IT, we'll talk on IT labs. 
So wide range of speakers and moderators. And then we had chairpersons. Chairpersons, we, the chairperson we used to take a clinical. If there's a talk on the urine examination, a pathologist is talking the urine, and there's a nephrologist at the end giving his or her perspective to students in 10 minutes. Voluntary participation by speakers, moderators, and uh, and students, and it was a free program. It is a free program. We don't take money from students. We don't give any money to teachers. As I told you, uh, this is the kind of a small WhatsApp university we call going through WhatsApp, and this is a free program. So there is no money involved here. The only Tata Trust is sponsoring it for mainly one reason that we need to have some credibility to the course. I, I could have done it from TMH, but I wanted more independent from TMH. So I thought I'll, and, and, and since Anita was with me, so I. We went to Tata Trust and they were happy. They sponsored our fees of the webinar jam. So we tried many platforms. We tried Zoom, Cisco WebEx, webinar jam, many ones, six, seven we tried. So I have a team of youngsters who are very good in it, Gaurav, Rohan, Satya, they all helped, Nikhil. And then we finally decided webinar jam. So we did this for two years and now we have shifted to, the second course now we started, we shifted to Cisco WebEx. Uh, we had right on oh no, this program has been possible only because of senior professors of in medical school and HODs because they only permitted. So this is not a program done by Anita or Sumit Gujarat. This is a program which is combined program. We are maybe the showcase of the program. But this not been possible. It would be possible if HODs do not permit the students to attend to participate inside seminars. So we have been writing to HODs and then we have a very good response. So we made groups on WhatsApp for moderators. Now what is moderators? There's a teacher, there's a chairperson. There are two moderators. Moderators are the young consultants, like assistant professors, associate professors. They want to learn, they have interest in teaching. So they join. They are like master of ceremony. So they help us to do the program. So I, I start a program and I go for a dinner. Moderators. So I'm not sitting there for the whole time. So I have moderators, they help me, and, and they also learn teaching. Those, we have many 240 moderators now. Few of them are head of the department. Few of them are head of the departments to moderate. They're not like, I want to teach. Like, it's not that I want to teach only. You can be a moderator, so they're very happy. And second group is a Telegram app group, which Satya created for me. I do not know Telegram app. He created this app, and we are now almost 13,900 members. And now I'll talk about this new group later. And we send letters, it invites by emails and WhatsApp and other things. Thus, we started, you know, as I told you, biology, systemic path, hematopath. And techniques, some the disease. Like this was the first talk, July 7, 2020, basic molecular pathology and epigenetics. Now, this is a private hospital, but Dr. Nurag Mata from Army Colonel Nurag is a very experienced man, the most experienced in molecular in India. So it was not, not the question of like AIMS or PGI has to talk wrong for molecular. We have to, you need somebody who is doing it and who knows it. Then we had oral cancer, then you know, side seminars. So this is like so we were shocked to see that the audience is going to 2000. It was 1500, 1800, 2000. And after 2000, it was stopped because the webinars are not going to take more than 2000. So we were really overwhelmed by the number of students. You can see here, this, this is 40,000 something, 45 attending at present. Here, you can see the 1652 live. 1973 registered at one time 60. So we had a huge number of, and we had chat box, we had feedback. Like this was a symposium, molecular biology spells the doom of, of morphology. It was a debate. So there are two of them, Dr. Venkat from Ames and another guy from, I think Anita from Anita. So molecular will spell the doom or not. And then, you know, you get the chat questions, you know, you get the audience involvement, the audience gives answers, their perspective. So we do some kind of statistical analysis. So this is again like Asavi gave a talk, or maybe Munita gave a talk, Asavi was chair and Anita, at the end of the talk, this was a talk on oral lesions. So again, we see that we have almost, this is the beginning of epidemic, uh, people had nothing to do. So they were all at home, so it became very popular and it, it, it really worked for us. So we had chat questions, feedback, you know, all kind of analysis we used to do. We still do. So many countries, this is India, like 1500, on one day there were 1545 students from India and then so many countries, like Bangladesh 15, Nepal 14 and 1126 from Myanmar. So almost 45 countries are participating now actively in this program. This is a whole group I'm showing you. Now we have made a, now this is a PG moderator group. Like we have 
218 plus 1028 moderators here. So this is on the WhatsApp. And then we have a Telegram app group that showed you this is almost 330,900 members. And these are link to become a member. Now this is Excel sheet. Now here Gaurav helps me to prepare the Excel sheet. What is, you can just to show you how we work. These are like the number of the talk. This is 77, 78. 77 is a talk, Tuesday, and Thursday is a seminar. Tuesday is a talk, Thursday is a seminar. The Tuesday talk is on prostate pathology. Who's taking? Santosh man. Seminar. Okay, let's see the seminar on uh, on this, this day. Gynex cytology cases. Kamal Mehrban. This is a professor from Nagpur. She's taking a class on this Thursday. Uh, she's a cytology pathologist, and uh, her name was recommended, and she's taking as a our class of gynex cytology where we have six students. Then after that, artifacts in histopathology on Tuesday, 17 January. Speaker Parveen Mahajan. And after that, there's a chairperson. There's, there's a speaker, then the chairperson like here. Speaker is Dilip Giri. Chairperson is Sudeep Gupta. Topic is malignant lesions of breast. Dilip is in the United States. Sudeep Gupta is director of Attract EMH. He does breast medical oncology. So he can give his uh, medical oncologist's opinion. And then next, we have a, uh, and then we have students here. How do we take students? We have divided zones. North zone. Uh, west zone, east zone, south zone, and a foreign country. So we have a list of all zones made, and this, we have a long waiting list of these students also. Like this is a waiting list. So this is like no, this is like the you know, I have, I have, I have children and other. So like that, and then that's a foreign country. That's all. So we have ample number of students thanks to HODs. So work has been um, COVID time has been has kept us busy uh, and, and enjoyable. And uh, as I said, work from home is not that I've been working and not enjoying. Many times I go to my club. If you come to Bombay, I'm sure one of you, two of you might have visited. I'll take you to this beautiful US club. So I take my laptop there and it works and I enjoy my, my, my coffee there, my, my snacks there. And work goes on. And, and you can meet your old resident with the kids, you know, if they have small, small babies. So COVID timing was to meet people also. So it was total fun and enjoyment and without any money. And you know, it was having good implications, far reaching implications. So we have students from, you know, these are the presenters from all over India, mostly very few from Europe. We wanted Indian speakers who have Indian accent for Indian audience. So we have tried our best to take only Indian, only one or two foreigners, which like we have a talk by Fabiola materials next month, this month on placentas. Now we don't have many teachers in placenta in India. We don't do much diagnostic. So Fabiola is very good. And name recommended by Vikram Deshpande. Vikram or Junaya, somebody recommended and she did a great job last time. We have moderators from all over India, and we have moderators from Bangladesh, Nepal, Sri Lanka. So the moderators have gone out now. Attendees from, as I told you, from even from, uh, you know, all over. Now this is a medical school, uh, medical college in North India, where the teachers are attending. They don't have any students. So these are the old teachers who sit in the department in the morning, look at look at the replay, or in the evening, all of them together. And I'll skip off the statistics. Again, you know, these attendees and students from different parts. So mostly Indian and rest of Asia and Africa. So these three areas, if you say, India, rest of Asia and Africa, is, it has reached almost everywhere. So and so, uh, Royal College of Pathologists approves us. It's unbelievable. And they, we get a call from the Royal College, the president, ex-president, now she's in charge of teaching in Royal College. They wanted to put our talks on the Royal College website. So it was an honor. But I said, you are a um, private body. You are charging money to be a member of the free program. So we cannot give you our talks. But your students can attend our talks. So these are different colleges, you know, students are attending online. So HODs send you pictures. So it became popular those days during the COVID times. So I think I'll skip this. Yeah, these are some feedback questions. We, we, we open the feedback in the Telegram app once in three months or four months. We keep it closed, otherwise, otherwise there will be all junk, unnecessary junk. So we open it once in four months for feedback and take the feedback from students, teachers. Now, the drawbacks were what? Obviously, it is boring for speakers and students also. Lack of eye, eye contact, inability to adjust the attention of the audience, how are reacting. One to one teaching and questioning is impossible in a large group. Practical hands on training is difficult. So, it's difficult to impact. Look at the assessment. How do you assess it? So, many achievements I've told you already, and I don't want to repeat it. Now, this is like Anchu from Varda. She's a professor there. Uh, various activities you get comments. Uh, Congratulatory. They're very happy that things are is going very well. And there are a few failures. 
now from 2000 we come down to 200 to 500 if this is a talk on a little bit on the biology which is not approach to round cell tumor it will be only 200 220 students and out of that 220 maybe 70% are teachers who are into that area they would like to. so you have to be very selecting about talks one which talks is like the students do not want to listen to any theoretical but some theoretical are important so we are not like making compromise on that we are keeping some theoretical there so our talks are mostly to surgical path and he had very little clinical chemistry and clinical pathology so that was another drawback because prior practitioners and many medical schools they needed yeah means so now um, first program was over so we started the second program so we thought what next we thought uh, we need to include more private practitioners from busy labs to have involve them for talks because they have so much experience they can share on many uh, like blood sugar like you know routine common tests so how do, nobody from institutes can teach you as much as private practitioner can teach you about um, costing about day to day problems of instruments instruments and technologies so we yeah more effort on pg learning and then now oh, these are the another three two three things suggestion from many students you please have integrate otp bgp means few actuaries but many students wanted ki sir if you can for 7 pm is not a good time we do it at 7 pm tuesday thursday many most of the college students are ladies and they go home few of them are married they have to cook or they are traveling home or some people are working in the department some are on night duties so time is not comfortable we could not find any other time we thought 7 pm is the best time we didn't want to work on weekends we thought tuesday thursday is the best weekend we should not work we kept that now many students said can you make it in the day time we have a general club on monday so then we discussed on that but then we thought we are trying to infringe into the teaching of medical schools we should not do that let the 9 to 6 time or the time is medical school we should not otherwise it was a suggestion from three uh, maybe four actually is that we can have it in the day time so the students can attend <coughs> but then it, it was shot down by us only then students wanted online cert- examination and certification they wanted certificates then we thought we should not do that because if we do that for to attract people it's kind of making making an academy which we do not want to make an academy it's just a go inside and come out we don't uh, keep it for our exams and we are not interested in credit points as of now but there is a lot of pressure from teachers as well as many students they want to have credit hours but i do not know how it help basically just to increase so we are we not in favor of that so first course was over and my colleagues we cut a cake in the department with then we thought we have been given two years it's a effort but as i told you it was an enjoyable effort you do nothing you don't like so you do whatever and only when you like it so we decided in my lab that we should do second part and we started the second part anita and we said through and we cut down three talks in a week we made it not two talks it was monday tuesday thursday now it will be only two tuesdays and thursdays now audience as, as i told you from 2000 it come down to 200 not 400 it came down to 170 180 220 some good speaker 300 350 so it was sad but you can't you know, because as i said the online is boring it gets toxic you know too much and i do not know how many of pathology students will agree with me we do not want to learn also. you know many of us do not want to learn we were happy with our life so you know you can't force students teaching so we do not learn kitna padhoge aap hum nahi padhte hum nahi koshish nahi so that is my attitude also as a student it was mine even today maybe i'm lazy so you can't force so how much education teaching will you give so for that reason we came from 3 days to 2 days we cut down on some biology because we me and anita decided the day goes to less than 100 students per day we stop because we spending time and effort but we are enjoying it but it's not worth it it's less than 100 now this is a, my this lady was my clerk for 5 7 years then she left the job her the baby she joined me on this program ruchi she is helping tremendously this young boy nikhil also helps me rohan sardana is going to us now So these are we are making a second program or to be to be sitting in Starbucks in Batunga. <coughs> so now second program has started. O T B B G P two from April five Tuesday talk Thursday side seminars. We have taken Cisco WebEx number from five hundred to two hundred. Now it has gone up again. The last one month maybe because we have started some new schemes now. So number has gone up to again four hundred, five hundred, six hundred. 
Now, now we keep retailing for 48 hours. Now the question is, why don't you keep it for more than 48 hours? The reason for not keeping replay links is we have 130 teachers and every teacher is very good, but many of them, they copy sometimes from books and they do not give acknowledgement. So there's a copyright issues. And we in India are still not, we do not know much about copyright issues. Many people take pictures from the books, pictures from the textbooks, pictures from the previous speakers. So, and they teach. There's nothing wrong in it, but you have to acknowledge it because some people might not agree. So we wanted to come out, we want to teach students and not get into any legal issues and come up to clean. So we thought we'll keep it only for two days for those students who were busy cooking or traveling or on the night duties and will not give more than two days. I was not in favor of giving more than one day. Dr. Borges forced me to give two days at least. So he kept it for two days. Exact number of students is much more because there are, like in my department of pathology and DMH, there's one computer, students are working and seven, eight are sitting there. So the number when I say 200, it is not the exact number. So you know another another WhatsApp group we have made with the medical college across India and across Asia and Africa, where I have now with HODs I got uh, student direct interaction with students thanks to KGMU also to develop permitting me to make this group. So let's say this is look at this now. This is Yanepoa Medical College. This aim is there. Now I in this group Dr. Venkat is there and all his uh, 24 students are there. And here uh, this is maybe broken in Cancer Hospital Russia. So this is Arvind in Turkey. So I, we have now 200 medical colleges with students named groups. This is the lead, a recent thing which we did, basically to interact directly with students and find out what they like. Now to summarize, now this is a positive from the COVID. We could make this program. It's a free program. We have good teachers and we are very lucky to have teachers who are free to teach. HODs are recommending students. They can recommend students for participation. Both are learning teachers, students. Everybody is a student. This is the Rigan app, it's got far reaching. Oops, sorry. Far reaching. I think the, most of the whole of Africa is the Rigan app. It's, it's phenomenal. Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Burma, Pakistan, Nepal, and maybe uh, the other countries have fewer attendance, but these countries have huge um, attendance. Long way to go, and we are open to feedback and to improve it. How do we do it? So these are my colleagues who are like Shweta and Gaurav are with me totally in this program. Anita, my wife Sheeta, and there are two more, uh, I, sh I should not forget the names, Kanyakan and uh, Dr. Um, Ramaswamy. Ramaswamy is an HOD of uh, Medical College in Kapam, and Kanyakan is an associate professor, in, assistant professor in UCMS. They help me a lot in this program. Whenever I'm missing, they take over. They become the, uh, they do my job if I'm traveling somewhere. And this is my group. Thank you very much. And we are having now, this year we will have the live program on July 11th. We couldn't have it for change. If any suggestions, I'll be happy if you can mail. I don't I think we're not in short of time now, but I'm happy to take a question or a comment if you have anybody has. No relation to questions are not allowed. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so for enlightening us. We always learn and learn from you. Now I request the dignitaries to please confer the Oration Award to Dr. Sumit Kusha.
laboratory practices and key for enhanced health and disease management. Thank you. First, I would like to congratulate Department of Pathology and KGMU for their 110th Founders Day celebration. And uh, my heartfelt thanks to all the members of the KGMU and Pathology for inviting us and to be part of this celebration. So, uh, I am working as a consultant in the biochemistry department of Sargangaram Hospital and I am also quality manager, which gets you close to ISO 15189. So, ISO 15189 is a standard which has been close to my heart for um, since 2004. And it is a very vast standard. All of us uh, must be aware that at some point of time we must have used it, utilized it. It is a very vast standard and every time you read it, you find something new in that and you realize that how it is patient oriented as well as your safety oriented. So whatever you are doing, how you are doing it in a better way. So before I begin my presentation, a brief introduction about my organization, Sir Gangara Hospital. Uh, New Delhi. It was first established in 1921 at Lahore by Sir Gangaram. In recognition for his services, the government of Pakistan has retained the name of the hospital and which is now attached to Fatima Jinnah Medical College. After partition, Sir Gangaram Trust Society founded Sir Gangaram Hospital at New Delhi, inaugurated by Prime Minister late Pandit Jawaharlal Nehruji in 1954. And today it is one of the leading tertiary care hospitals of India and thanks to visionary Sir Gangaram Hospital. And I'm also very proud to be uh, uh, sharing with you that uh, the current hospital, current labs of our hospital, like uh, previous one, uh, as I mentioned, that it started in 1954, but in 2005, we came up with a new building and all the new departments with world-class facilities. So at that time, they were inaugurated by then President APJ Abdul Kalamji in 2005, and that was the year we attained accreditation. and. Uh, in India, we are the first hospital-based laboratory to get accreditation and since then we have been maintaining our international standards for all the laboratory services. We all know that lab reports aid in 70% of the medical clinical decisions and the activity of labor all of us laboratory professionals, be it a pathologist, biochemist, microbiologist, hematologist, are interconnected with all other medical disciplines. And whenever we go and consult any physician, so after understanding, whenever a physician takes complete history and all, a detailed prescription is handed over to the patient and it often includes testing for biomarkers. So the journey, patient thinks that sample given and the report is received. No, it is not that short journey. Receiving a test report and all this, it takes such a long thing and we medical professionals work behind the scenes and behind the cure. Hence, the role of clinical laboratory services is very crucial integral component of healthcare system. So what is the requirement? That we produce accurate, reliable and timely test reports to the patients and to the clinicians. Why? Because it aids in diagnosis, management and treatment of diseases. And all of us must have been aware or must have experienced that at some point of time, the revolution in laboratory services have come from manual testing to fully automation. But uh, when we have come to fully automation, does it mean that the role of the personnel has reduced? No, it is not. So advancements, technical innovations and development of newer biomarkers has led to substantial revolution as well as to the reliability of laboratory data is of paramount importance and to obtain good reliable data, we need good laboratory practices. So what are good laboratory practices? It has a history to date back, a set of principles that define a quality system concerned with the process and the conditions under which laboratory testing is planned, performed, monitored, recorded, so many steps are there. It was first introduced in New Zealand and Denmark in 1972 and later in the US by FDA in 1976 and it took final shape in 1978. Why? In response to a falsified and poorly documented toxicology data which was submitted by certain organizations seeking drug approvals, most notably the pharmaceutical company Biogress uh, Labs. And it became the headline news at that time and because it was a very big lab which used to run, uh, run uh, tests for big companies. So it was found that mice which they had used had developed cancer uh, for because they were tested for cosmetics such as lotion and deos and lab through the dead mice and covered results deeming the products good for human consumption. It was shocking. So those involved in production, distribution and sales for the lab eventually died. Uh, 
So the concept of the good laboratory practices formally started from there. And the purpose is what we do, we write what we write, we should do. It ensures that the data submitted are true reflection of the results what we are getting. We are not fabricating any results. It ensures that the data is traceable. If someone asks us, can you show us the record of last 10 years or 15 years? Yes, we are able to do so. And more important is it promotes international acceptance of the test. Who regulates good laboratory practices in India? The National GLP Compliance Monitoring Authority was established by Government of India and it was done on 24th April 2002 and initially it was under Department of Science and Technology which was under Ministry of Commerce and now uh, the NABL is the uh, formal body which gets accreditation that means it uh, accredited lab as per the international standard which functions again under Quality Council of India which is a subsidiary of Government of India. So, uh, as you can see, everything has a traceability. So, lab is not a simple thing. It is not a place where data is generated. It requires complex integration of expertise in all the steps of laboratory functioning. No magic happens in the lab. And how do we get help in getting uh, performing better, performing in a proper way? With the help of ISO. And for medical laboratory testing, it is ISO 15189. What does it do? It has all the requirements of quality and competence. And all of this together leads to good laboratory practices if we implement. So ISO 15189 has a short history that it uh, came into existence in 2003, then revised in 2007, then in 2012. And in 2012, the primary focus was on laboratory information management. Why? Because automation had come, uh, the use of computers had come. So we are doing everything in a right way, but when we are feeding in the computer, if that is not properly transcribed or reproduced, then uh, the things are not in a correct way. Then, uh, now the current standard uh, has been again revised. ISO 15189 2022 has been now published, but a resolution has been given. We will be given three years' time to implement this, this standard. And it is the single most uh, standard where 50,000 laboratories are globally accredited. And as of date, India, uh, in India, NABN and QI are the two bodies who are providing accreditation. And this accreditation, what we achieve is uh, valid for two years. And uh, you must have heard about ILEC and MRA. What is the significance of having ILEC uh, uh, associated? That means that it is International Organization for Accreditation Bodies. Like we are getting accredited by NABL. NABL is getting accredited by ILEC. And that means our reports are internationally acceptable. So patient who is coming to KGM, to Ganganam, if they go abroad, US, UK, anywhere across the globe, their reports will be acceptable if it is to the uh, uh, NABL accredited lab. And this is the kind of certificate also we uh, everyone who gets accredited receives. And uh, this is the certificate uh, and on report also we use this. I have been taking examples uh, from my hospital only and I will be touching upon only on those topics being an assessor also and uh, wherever I find that lab has been doing, lab does tremendously good work but what happens, there are certain points where lab doesn't know how to maintain the documents. I will be sharing that experience with all of you. So to attain and maintain accreditation is that so simple? It is simple but yes at the same time no and people feel that once we have achieved it why do we need to get it again and again? Why every year? So to keep your documents and your policies updated and to identify newer things, yes, we need to uh, get it accredited every time. And for one single report, whoever uh, comes to our uh, hospital or to your organization, we have to follow each and everything for reporting and release of reports. If you trace back any document related to this, we will be any 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 accredited lab will be able to show you that. So. To maintain quality, to check for conformances, these are all the requirements, responsibilities, procedures, register maintenance, review, and all these things. So as I said, the 2012 version was primarily focused on uh, laboratory information management. The new version which has come up now is risk management. It has more focus on risk management. So earlier it used to be risk management used to be a very small thing, okay, we will do some risk management. But now the primary focus is uh, that how to avoid something happening from wrong. So, before you do anything in all the three phases of the lab, pre-analytical, analytical and post-analytical, just think about three basic steps. Is there any risk involved? Risk not that it is doing directly harm to us. If it, anything is deteriorating, anything is not uh, giving correct results. So, identify, then assess it and then mitigate it to find a solution and then calculate the hazard score. So, like uh, if floor is slippery, 
and uh, if someone gets slipped it becomes dust if someone see it before it is happening if you cross that area without stepping on it then the risk effect is minimum so that way whatever phase you are working in your lab focus on risk so in subsequent audits this will be more highlighted and before you do anything just make a proper organogram of your institute whichever way your department your hospital your institute is functioning so that people know what they are doing many a times people many people are doing many things but they are not aware is it actually my responsibility is it part of my job responsibility so systematic approach so make a quality manual make a policy then your procedures then your workflow procedures then documentation of your results and documentation of the actions taken and the effectiveness of the action taken and then head of the institute or head of the laboratory issue a quality policy here also i would like to share in quality objectives many a times being an assessor i have found that people define objectives and objectives should always be measurable but people define objectives and those are objectives are not measurable then it becomes a nc so even if you are defining only two objectives just define in a way which you can measure for example your turnaround time your uh, sample rejection rate so define your objectives and teach your technical staff also to monitor them and it should be uh, verified and validated by the head of the laboratory good documentation is also very important many a times in audits we have seen that uh, we uh, Uh, quality manager and other department is very well aware about document but when it is asked to the lower staff or to the residents they say we don't know where this document is so good documentation is where people can find it understand it use it and share it and return it to its place so the best part in today's days is you make a sharing folder on the computer system share it across your residents across your fellows make it a pdf non editable copy so that no one can make changes and it is very much possible these days with the help of uh, the it these are the four level of documents which every lab should keep and many a times the nc is on the level 3 and level 4 they don't have proper work instructions they don't have proper work format so we are doing everything but if we are not recording it properly in a, a format and uh, documented properly then again it becomes a nc then document control what does it mean that if i am keeping it under lock and key no that is not a document control this also is a very uh, uh area in the iso 1518 where people don't understand properly so i was i thought because of students i have thought of sharing with all of you so basically document control means that the document has been approved by the authority who has the uh, right to do so anyone cannot do that if i am not the hod then i don't have any right so the uh, and then the document is given the number suppose your institute kgnu slash department slash that document initials and the number so if you tell your staff get that document number 5 so he can or she can easily go and find it then most important document log people have hundreds of registers hundreds of files but they don't remember how many they have so prepare a proper document log so that if someone asks because all of us cannot remember everything every time so we just open that log we see okay you want q file i'll just get it that is clinical chemistry qc then when you distribute because you have to distribute your documents so just get take the receiving many times staff says no we don't know you didn't share with us we didn't know so to have that avoidance just take the signatures from your staff and if possible take full signature and uh, short signature also you must have noticed many times we take short signatures and when traceability comes then you oh this was not my signature so you can trace things then service register agreement now in the new iso 15118 unique id is mandatory earlier it was not but now it is mandatory and with the uh, akhil bharatiya digital mission also by modi ji uh, now the unique id for any patient is important so for labs what is important sample is important when you, whenever anyone will come to the hospital and sample has to be taken can we remember if you are doing thousands of tests maybe 500 or 700 tests many no one can remember so we should have a very robust primary sample collection manual in which all the types of samples all the types of tubes and what are the specific instructions for that tube they should be all mentioned and if by any chance suppose we made our uh, in 2023 beginning we made a sample collection manual and suddenly we realize okay now this is the bio marker or this is the test which we can start then we have a provision of making amendment and add to that because quality of laboratory sampling be it for biochemistry hematology cytopathology knowledge of the staff involved in blood collection is very important and uh, patient sample matching is very important and transportation conditions which can be done either manually or by shoot system uh, there is a sending station and receiving station are you people using a shoot system in your hospital 
so it becomes very convenient and uh, kgmu is much ahead of many many other organizations so very soon you may have it helps us in getting timely samples especially when it comes from ot icu and all and then receiving proper receiving uh, department uh, helps and keeping a bell at the because if the department runs 24 hours and the night staff is less then proper functioning of the bell so that if whoever comes to the window can be attended and then acceptance criteria should be clearly defined because every sample cannot be accepted and rejection uh, cannot be rejected also many a times precious samples are uh, have to be taken in spite of uh, being little hemolyzed or due to some of the rejection criteria. Then uh, you also must be getting all barcoded samples. The best advantage of barcoding is that uh, no sample mix-up, no ID mix-up, it doesn't happen. And it gets all the information uh, onto the HIS, including demographic details, location from where the patient, IPD or OPD, and then the work list is generated. Centrifugation again is very important. Calibration of centrifugation is very important. So why centrifugation I touched upon when I go uh, for any assessment when I ask the lab, do you have SOP for centrifugation? They say, no, it is not required. We are only for equipments. Centrifugation is for whoever is doing testing in serum, plasma, or in urine also, centrifugation. And then you have to define the uh, different speeds uh, and different times for centrifuges. So uh, each sample cannot be centrifuged at the same speed. Then uh, sample is distributed to various locations, whichever part of the test is required. So now the sample has reached to the destination where testing has to be done. Uh, now it, it is very important that the personnel who are doing this, they are trained. So it is again job responsibility, be it HOD, be it any technical staff, they should know that how much is my role and how much, and they should take the receiving when they, uh, when we hand over responsibilities to them, they should be able to uh, give us back the receiving also. Then training, technical training, competency evaluation and safety training because the focus nowadays is on risk then the safety training and prevention of adverse incidents is very important and uh, many a times training by external agencies also we take and this is the way we keep the competency evaluation of each and every staff. And when any new staff joins because whenever you, there are so many things in your department which you may want to tell your resident or to your consultant that you have to do this, this, this. So make a flowchart as per your requirements, how you want to introduce your resident or your faculty to work on. Then it will be a different induction program for the technical staff also because they want to learn in a different way. And whatever you do, whatever you communicate, just note it down. There must be uh, many uh, junior executives in, in the department, so just ask them to note down if they cannot type and get it signed because they forget. And uh, then adequate space is very important, lighting, power plugs, minimized uh, space of uh, uh, moving space in the lab, fire alarm and sensors and no exposed cables, no interference between the different departments and they should function differently, independently from each other. And uh, the safety facilities are provided and uh, they are trained also. Eye wash, very important, with fire exit plan for your hospital. Then uh, these safety devices which we install, they should be periodically checked for the safety of the personnel. Uh, logbook of that should be maintained. Then equipment trained by trained personnel, they should be operated and then the proper uh, relevant instructions, uniquely labeled and maintained uh, records of your equipment for the lifetime. If you want to keep them for 10 years, keep them for 10 years because accreditation is validity for two years but that doesn't mean that you don't need to if from the date it has come to your organization until the time it goes out from your organization whenever you do any test validation verification data we have been often seen that it is missing so it is important to keep acceptance criteria and uh, storage of reagent and samples cold room it really helps in uh, minimizing the space in minimizing the number of uh, refrigerators and uh, the other refrigerators minus 80 because there are certain tests which we do for research and all. So we need to keep for a longer period. Then SOPs um, are very important and analyze wise what, whatever you are doing. So as I said in the beginning, whatever you are doing, write whatever you write, do it accordingly. Then quality control. There are two types of quality control you must be aware, internal and external. So before internal quality control is passed, do not run the test. Whatever, whichever way of quality control you have, be it uh, for a serum-based test, be it for a urine, be it for a, another, any other tissue or something. And uh, after that, when you are confident and you are sure that it is passed, then only you go ahead with the testing of the patient sample. 
external quality assurance how does it help because it gives us the perspective and the, uh, on a higher uh, global level and we have all the international and national uh, facilities available in our country now frequency can be decided as per the analyte and uh, which type of pt for which analyte that has to be because single pt program does not cover all analytes so we have to choose very judiciously because it is it has to be cost effective also that which pt program we should take it and then uh, this is another nc which i have observed in many of the audits that people do participate in pt program people do send very methodically every month but when it comes back it is not reviewed so please review it uh, and share it with your staff also because they are the ones who are running the test that yes this uh, this month's pt uh, result has come and uh, how is the performance and if there is any outlier make a kappa form and fill in the reason was it a random error and what was it a some technical error so that we are aware and we can keep a track of it then internal if by any chance that if a pt program is not available then ilc ilc is interlaboratory comparison you are doing something i am doing something from two different institute then we can share program with each other and we can share samples with each other and uh, then accordingly uh, the frequency can be decided as per the analyte if you are receiving some analyte for example we are doing tetrolimus we are receiving 50 samples per day then we have to do it monthly otherwise six monthly can also be done quarterly can also be done and after that what should we do should we just uh, send the sample to them and receive the sample no we need to define a criteria that this was lab one result this was lab r result and what was the variation was variation acceptable or not so what were, what are the guidelines to define because they are clear and all these they have very wide broad guidelines so you need to define your own criteria and uh, test which are quant which have quantitative results which have cv in that you can take mu mu is measurement of uncertainty which is approximately double of cv so individually you have to focus on each analyte how it is acceptable and in addition there are certain analytes where it is not possible for anyone to have because in assessment no pt program is not available uh, ilc could not do but then you have a possibility of doing split sampling and as per the stability of because for ammonia lactate and all these kind of tests when we are not able to send it outside so split sampling is done again the variance is calculated and the acceptable criteria is defined then reporting of results it should be done in order of preference despite being lis many a times or test which was order first is left uh, for late reporting so focus on that is also required whatever because lis is a beautiful thing it has all the possibilities whatever you want to see and uh, release of reports is done by the qualified consultants only and uh, critical values very important for tertiary care hospital where transplants active icus hdus and all so any critical value identified within the defined turnaround time it should be informed and uh, and this thing also when we uh, go to any lab and we see the critical values they don't have any traceability so whatever critical values you are defining keep a traceability either it should be from the standard textbooks or it should be from the clinicians and all record of communications should be maintained and uh, you format you report your design your report format in a way that it should have all the contributes whatever i also ask just you should be able to show that what type of test which department what was the id and uh, from where it came and uh, what time sample was received who released the report and uh, what type of uh, sample was used and which method which unit which uh, what is the bri for the same and any interpretation was it any if there was any critical value was it informed or not and uh, is it only one page report or many pages report and is it accredited by nbl or not and do we have i like mri or not then disposal is very important as per the biomedical waste management guidelines and pre treatment should be done for the safety of the people who are working in lab and lis system i am sure you people also must be having with a complete audit trail there you can see what report entered at what time which report which test received and uh, what are the demographic details of the patient from where so if you want to contact any patient for any history you find something very rare and uh, like we are we do lab testing we found a patient with a very heavy lead toxicity and clinician also could not give the history so we called the patient and we found out that that patient was taking ayurvedic medicines and because of that uh, and for that patient he was given ayurvedic medicine for treating diabetes so because of that he was uh, he had developed lead toxicity and our clinicians were able to treat him on time the transparency this uh, this system also i miss when i go to assessments that whatever is in the machine it should be on the lis whatever is on the lis 
it should be on the printout and that should be uh, we should be able to show and as per the ISO 15110 2012 there is a requirement of six monthly verification of 10 to 15 tests you may be doing 500 tests so it is not possible that you do so many tests uh, every time you keep four printout and all and you don't need to even keep printout you can keep a soft copy also for all of these and then you may find the role and responsibility of a technical staff clearly on papers uh, because this is also a requirement that who can access patient data, who can enter patient data, who can change patient data, and who can authorize the release of examination results. Feedback, very, very much important. They should be evaluated properly in a hospital-based laboratory. There should be a shortest turnaround time to evaluate the feedback. And if any complaint is seen from anyone, then proper, adequate proper should be taken. And key quality indicators, again, it is no, not a set defined rule. You can identify quality indicators as per your functioning. And every quarter, you can change quality indicators. When we feel that this quality indicator is uh, very good, not turnaround time, we are doing well. So now we can leave it. We can move to the another uh, quality indicator. Then uh, I'm touching upon only on those points, uh, time limits. Uh, we should define clearly many a time patient comes after a week. They say, you know, you are NABL accredited, you must keep the sample. So we should be able to show that, no, we are keeping sample only for this duration. So depending on the type of the sample, you keep your documents ready. Then if any verbal requests come, how to attend that? And in any case, because mistakes can happen from anyone, if there is a need of amendment. So this also we have observed that when we release the amended report, we do not write this footnote many a times that this is an amended report, this report supersedes the previous report of the same episode number. Because if any patient by any chance goes to the court, then they can clearly say, that, yes, we had given right report to the patient, his complaint, his or her complaint is not correct. Then give any good uh, importance to staff meetings, even your technical staff, your ward by if they are giving good suggestion for the improvement of the system. Just note it down, try to review it, and if possible, implement it. And do your internal audit very judiciously and uh, be very sure that you are not doing internal audit of your own section. If I am a quality manager, I am not doing QMS. If I am biochemist, I am not doing my biochemistry. So impartiality because I will not be that uh, transparent and uh, judicious in doing that. And whatever you do, present it to your management and document it. That this was the review input, this was the review output and what we expect from our management. Maintain all records. And every time, improve yourself. Don't limit yourself for the whatever was discovered and whatever was there. Like for, from the existing test, you can make profiles like micronutrient profile, toxic profile, uh, there's a, a malnutrition screening profile. From the existing test only, you can do that. So risk biomarkers, baseline parameters, so how we can tissue organ damage and assessing the utility of other associated biomarkers. Then research projects and that I could hear in the morning with no opening uh, speech that research projects are a very integral component of your uh, uh, organization and we should encourage wherever we go we should encourage and try to do more patient oriented research and we are proud to say that our uh, hospital is one of the few uh, private hospitals which are recognized for research by department of science and technology and uh, we have both intramural and extramural funding and also from dbt and phfi these are the current uh, various uh, research projects which are ongoing and uh, we are hoping transnational outcome from these and we have written books, chapters and annual newspaper as well and we are part of IFCC, also Global Medley Week, uh, I mean this is uh, for four years, three years and we are planning to conduct good activities all over the India so that we can promote good laboratory practices and uh, last year we uh, demonstrated laboratory's vital role in global fight against the COVID pandemic and Currently, we have started doing implementing sigma metrics also because it used to feel that it is a very difficult calculation and it is not only for quantitative results, even for qualitative things, you can measure your sigma because it can help us in reducing the number of quality controls, reducing the number of manpower and we may be doing something very correctly, which after only measuring the sigma, we will come to know. So these three variables, uh, total allowable error, bias and CV, if we measure them, we will be able to minimize the cost of the reagents which we are utilizing. Then there is a program called Phlebotomy Championship Program, which, which is uh, provided by the PD, encourage your technical staff to participate in this. Last two years, technical staff from Gangana Hospital have been the country winner. So uh, you can uh, call upon PD people and to try to uh, register your technical staff as well. Then we are working with the uh, Evidence-Based Laboratory Medicine IFCC Committee for identification of your biomarkers. 
and uh, reducing and also reducing non contributory laboratory testing practices which have been very old now not uh, uh, apt for the patient like for uh, in, in comparison to creatinine if we look into cystatency and other biomarkers uh, so we can promote the use of those biomarkers instead of repeating creatinine many times if we have another option instead of uh, repeating glucose every time if we can measure glycosylated if we make, for diabetic patient fructosamine so these kind of biomarkers we need to uh, promote future planning from gangaram hospital we are plan, uh, making an equal program for uh, which uh, is which will be available for all the users uh, small labs also and it will be cost effective and this will bring affordable quality assurance all across the lab and we are in pipeline of starting fellowship programs in clinical biochemistry and uh, we have started international interpretative comments in cases associated with all sections of clinical laboratory services so we we'll register it uh, share the registration link with all of you very soon if anyone interested please share that so from all across the globe people will participate and interpret your cases and uh, uh, interpret the cases and we have gone completely now uh, paperless all soft copies are maintained one obsolete and one current documents and test results if it is false positive then what it can happen over in this diagnose emotional trauma inappropriate intervention and if it is false positive misdiagnosis untreated diseases deterioration of the case so we need to integrate all the educational and scientific tools to promote the implementation of good laboratory practices and advanced clinical diagnosis by research and dissemination of new knowledge several elements must be taken into account audit practice identifying the question search for evidence critical evaluation translating the good quality of research into everyday practice and keep yourself updated to all new mandatory requirements so the journey of the sample which uh, clinicians feel that it is very small it is very long and so many steps we need to cover and so many documents we need to keep and i believe since 2005 that quality is not an act it is a habit and whatever many times it happens if something is not even written in the standard we do it for our own sake and we have been saved if anything asked by any of the senior person so thank you very much for patient hearing uh, thank you very much any question for anyone as a correction question so thank you very much thank you ma'am for such an informative session we genuinely gained a lot now i request our respected head professor us singh to please confer the correction award to dr mamta kamra It is an honor that our referred teacher, Professor P. K. Agarwal Madam, is here with us. I would like H O D sir and other eminent guests to kindly honor her.
Professor Madhumati Goelna, Professor Manmohan Chan sir, and Dr. P. K. Gupta sir here with us. <laughs> I request Professor Manmohan Chan to please accept a small token of gratitude. Moving forward, I request respected. I request respected Professor Rashmi Kushwaha, Senior Professor, to kindly deliver a vote of thanks. Good afternoon to everyone. We have come towards the end of the Foundation Day program.
I would like to thank our honorable Vice Chancellor, Lieutenant General Bipin Puri sir, for sparing his valuable time out of the busy schedule. My sincere thanks to the Vice Chancellor, Dr. Vinish Sharma, Dean and Academics, Dr. A.K. Tripathi sir, for coming here and blessing us. My thanks to all the speakers who have traveled miles of distance to make this event successful. Dr. Sumit Gujar, Dr. Sumita Gokhale and Dr. Mamka Rangkar. In this cold weather, the chilly winds, they have traveled miles of distance and I want to tell one thing, yesterday almost every month's flight was delayed. Dr. Gujar has waited for 4 to 5 hours on the Mumbai airport. Similarly, Dr. Mamta and Dr. Sumita were made to wait at Delhi airport. But they still came, they took all the pain and came here and participated in the Foundation Day program. So thanks to all of them. My sincere thanks to senior faculty members, Professor P.K. Agarwal ma'am, Professor Madhumati Goyal ma'am, Professor Manoj Jain sir, Dr. P.K. Gupta sir and Professor Ashutosh Kumar sir who is present online. My thanks to all of you ma'am. My thanks to all the faculty members of the Department of Pathology, Dr. Preeti Agarwal, Dr. Malti, Dr. Shivanjali, Dr. Madhu Kumar, Dr. Sunara, Dr. Uh, Chanchal, Dr. Riddhi Jaswal, Dr. A.K. Singh sir, Dr. Vahid Ali and Professor Suresh Babu sir for being here and making this event a success. My thanks to, my to all the senior residents. Thanks to Dr. Manish who has worked day and night for the publication of the first issue of the departmental news center. He used to set, sit on the Arun photo stats for hours together, 5, 5, 6, 6 hours he has been sitting there and arranging everything set, finally getting it published. Thanks to Babo, like Babo has been traveling to and fro from the airport for the yesterday in transportation and uh, bringing the packages to the uh, KGMU. Thanks to other residents, Dr. Ramini, Jayas, Dr. Mithilesh, Dr. Risha, Dr. Nimadri, Dr. Prachit, Dr. Rohit, Dr. Pankas, Dr. Darima, Dr. Richa Singh and all the residents and everyone else who has spared time to be here. Thanks to one and all of you. Thank you so much. Thanks to all the media persons for wide coverage and thanks to technical staff who have been working hard day and night to make this event successful. Uh, there is lunch in the department HOD room, so all of you are requested to proceed for the lunch. Thank you.